And now, holy shit, folks. I always remind people, you know I am suspended for life for minor <laughs> hockey. <laughs> it's my duty to please the booty. Did you catch a rattlesnake and then drive home with it in your car holding it the whole time? Yep. Phil only drinks Coke. He doesn't drink water. I fucking quit. Fugazis. Fugazi. Fugazis. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 458 of Spit and Chip. Let's present the by Pink Whitney. From our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. That Summer's sounds ch- like the voice of someone who was backstage at a Morgan Wallen concert last oh, night. All right. oh, Jesus. Well, we got to get to that a little bit later, but on the old Barstool Sports Podcast family, hope you are enjoying all these interviews. We've got two coming up later, one with Tyler Toffoli, New New Jersey Devil, and the other one with a pair of young studs, Maddie Benares and Owen Powell, a couple of Michigan guys, so don't miss that. One of our semi-guests is back, casual guest, the man, Merle's. Dude, a lot of people wondering what you were eating this weekend, buddy. Yeah, it was uh, Croft Skiva. Croft Ooh. Skiva, I hope I'm saying that correctly. It's an annual crayfish party here in Sweden. Always a big deal. Anytime in August, you, you get the crayfish out. It was my first time being a part of it. So I may have <clears throat> dabbled into the Pink Whitney and uh, the beer a little too much, and I'm paying the price for it. Um, but yeah, it was a really cool thing. Everybody in our neighborhood met out there. Everybody brings a little dish, a separate dish, and then you all bring in the crayfish. Explain the crayfish though. Cause I saw that you were kind of struggling to eat it. Like, what do you just dip it in butter? Like, how is it eaten? How do you prepare it? Yeah. So different than uh, Louisiana where you see those big boils and everything's thrown in and then they just throw it on the table. Ours, we were eating them cold and it was it, really difficult. You know, it's, it, it's a miniature shrimp and, or a miniature lobster. And so you, you work the claw first and then you rip the body off. And if you rip it off the right way, there's like a little butter in there that you can scoop out with your finger. And, you know, it's a it's a lot of work for the little bit of meat that you get and stuff. But it's more just the tradition. We're singing songs. You're taking a shot of the, the schnapps afterwards. So it's, it's just a really fun time. We had a music quiz going. It was a it was a big night. But enough about me. That was not the important stuff of the weekend. I saw you guys handing out $100,000 to some people. What was that all about? Oh, spoiler alert. Yeah, me and uh, Grinelli and uh, our photographers, Quaida and Apuzo, went down to Brooklyn last week, uh, Williamsburg. All the money we raised from the hockey game back in April, all the ch- uh, gear we sold, people made donations. We were able to give the fire department and the police department $50,000 each, over $100,000. So first off, thank you to all the stoolies, all the Chicklets fans, anybody else who bought the shirts, the hats, donated. We can't thank you enough. Those guys were so appreciative of it. Appreciative of it. Uh, it was crazy. I didn't realize we raised that much money, G. And then to have the guys invite us over, they had pizzas waiting for us and soft drinks and gave us a tour of the house. And, you know, I, I was a little spocky as a kid, always chasing the fire, fire engines around the neighborhood and hanging out at my dad's houses over the years. So, you know, it, it was extra special to me to, to go over there and not just do that, but but see the looks on the guys' faces and see how, how much they appreciated what, what we did. And, you know, it's not us. It's, it's again, the people who, who donated all the money. It was just, like I said, the G, an honor uh, to go over there, hang out, get get the vibe. It was pretty cool. I mean, not cool that they had to go out in the truck, but it ended up being nothing. But just being in the house, G, remember that? They had to, you know, we got to see them all go to work, right, in real time and, and make a little video of it. Yeah, was uh, it was just awesome. I love going to the firehouses. I just every time I go in, I just get so wowed by the uh, the hangout rooms, like how they have this cool, just like little guys lounge. Basically, it's awesome. But in terms of the donations, it 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 was awesome, man. Because I I you know hanging with these guys, being around these guys, knowing these guys for almost two years now, we know how charity driven they are. From the PBA Children's and Widows Fund to like the Ray Fe- Ray Pfeiffer Foundation. There's just so many organizations that these guys help, that they support. So this money we know is going to a good cause. And um, you know we couldn't be happier with the relationship we have with the NYPD and FDNY because who knows what's going to happen in the future now. Absolutely. I got to try the bunker gear on. That's the first time I ever put it on head to toe. Weigh 60 pounds, Merle, that, all that equipment. And that's before you put the air tag on your back. So And we actually have a vlog of the whole thing coming out. The vlog drops. um, Well, actually, it will be live when the time this podcast drops. It releases um, on Sunday night. So, yeah, super, super excited to see that. You can see RA dress up in the fire gear. You can kind of see how the whole day went down. And you can find that on Chicklet's YouTube channel. I was given the blue steel in one of those pictures, G. Definitely going for uh, Mr. January in the calendar next year. But, folks, before we continue... It's the Wit Dog here, and you know it's time to talk some Pink Whitney. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you very much for drinking, more importantly, because this drink, it's taking the world by storm. 
How about those sound effects? As I've started to do these ad reads and get involved with really diving in deep to Pink Whitney and what it means to so many people out there, I told you I've been receiving DMs of special maybe occasions Pink Whitney's at, weddings, bachelor parties, bachelorettes. All I do know is that summer 2023, the Pink Whitney summer, is rolling on, rolling on, rolling on. It's like a boulder going down a hill. How about my sound effect? It's gaining speed, it's gaining momentum, and it's all because of you. You listeners, you guys getting involved in this, you guys drinking it with a little soda water, you guys drinking it with an energy drink, which everyone knows is my favorite, or you guys just ripping shots at a carnival. So continue to support the brand. I thank you so much. Lake people, golf people, beach people, stay away from the sharks, stay close to the Pink Whitney, and enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much. Witty out. Uh, you mentioned it earlier, G. Uh, Morgan Wallen. Uh, I honestly, I, full confession, I, I was not familiar with his music. I heard his name, you know, on Twitter or whatever he is. I, I'm not anti-country music at all. I, like I said a million times, mod music, I just don't really jam with it all that much. But uh, the the manager of Ernest, who's one of the opening acts, his his uh, manager Matt was kind enough to reach out through the one and only Glenny Balls uh, to invite the boys to the show. Whoever wanted to go. I was like, man, it's Friday night. I've been to a concert in two years. It's Fenway. Not to mention the scenery won't be too bad over there. So I said, yeah, man. And plus, it's a, it's a great great offer, great invitation. So I met him at Fenway. Dynamite kid. He was a huge hockey fan. Had his Panthers jersey on. And he had the Wayne, we had the, you know, Wayne and Goth pass. He just like, oh, that's everybody. He walked by everybody. Uh, sat in the green room before the show. Hung out. Uh, had a couple of drinks. And then he's like, oh, Ernest is going on. Come with me. And Walked from the green room out, right out to the stage. I was like, you never feel more like a rock star than, in that situation. And like, oh, I'm like, we're staying here. He's like, yeah, like the video I took, that was literally side stage. And I'm looking out at everybody. I was dying. I was hoping I see one of my friends up there, but I couldn't spy any from that angle. But just an awesome experience, uh, you know, to have people be that generous. And, you know, you got to see a little bit behind the scenes being in the green room. Like how many people are, are, are you know, the machine to that thing, 150 people on a toilet. You know, they got to go to another stop, put the whole stage up again, take it down. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a grind. And, Everybody I met was great, great people. And, and the show itself, like I said, I'm not familiar with this catalog at all because I, I, you know, like, I'm an old fogey, but a hell of an entertainment show, man. Like the fireworks, the fucking the explosions. It reminded me of a Kiss concert in a lot of ways, not musically, but just Country like the shows effects. are the best, RA, because they do do a lot of like rock music. They do yeah. a lot of rock covers. That's why I, I just think, I mean, the women, the beer, the, the music, it's just an unbelievable time from start to finish. But Merles, I got to ask you, like, were you surprised at all? So just to kind of give our listeners some preference, like, RA, 6 o'clock Friday night, we just get a text message. Don't hear anything from them beforehand. And we just get a simple text message of a video of RA at Fenway Park on the stage with the, with the crowd behind him. And then he just pans the camera to himself and just winks at the camera. I'm like, God damn it, of course. <laughs> Typical RA. And the worst part was, was on, I think it was Wednesday, RA mentioned to me when he was in New York that he was going to do this and that the guy was a Chicklets fan. And I was like, you know, maybe I'll come down for it. Obviously, I'm like, you know, I don't know. He didn't say they have backstage passes or anything. I don't know. I'm just going to stay home for this one. Of course, I see this uh, video. I'm staying mush. in on a Friday night. I'm just shooting myself <laughs> right now. I'm, the only thing I'm surprised about is that he actually had a pass. When I when I saw the video, I assumed he just snuck in there like he does to the Stanley Cup parties. So happy you did it the legit way this time, Rear. Yeah, it happens once in a while. I, you could probably see it my leg in that picture. I had to get Green Monster. I was like, holy shit, I was so wrapped up in the clunts. I'm like, oh, yeah, the Green Monster's right here. So I got a pitch out, point to the Boston sign. And my kicks, listen, rule, big rule. Like You get your gambling rules, Merrill's concert rules. Never wear nice kicks to a concert, especially if you're down on the floor, dude. Like, you just got to roll them. So the Great ones call. Biz bought me uh, a couple of years ago, they're a little beat up. So, so that's why my sneakers were grubby. But yeah, it, it was, like I said, just a great experience. The show was great. Uh, I didn't stay. I went back after just for one quick one, but they were wrapping up. They had a, they had a screw, but they said Glenny Balls was there the night before. He was like, oh, Glenny Balls was in here at 1 o'clock in the morning last night. So he came in like while well, before the show. It was like Norm walking into Cheers. They're like, hey, Glenny. Like, every fucking guy in the room was like, yeah. He's a rock star. Shit. Uh, he is ha absolutely hilarious. So, but yeah, right, it, speaking it, of yeah. uh, events uh, that you won't have to sneak into, we have the uh, 20th Barstool Awards Ooh. this week in Boston. Uh, very excited to get up to Boston to go to these. Uh, it's hosted by Dave. It's at the House of Blues. I wanted to ask you guys, especially you, RA, you know, you've been at this company longer than anyone. What is your favorite Barstool sports memory since the dawn of, this, of Barstool? I'm, it's going to probably be a selfish answer, but 
you know, June 15th, 2011. I mean, like, Brian McGonigal, Boston sports. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and you know, Dave, you know, Dave, when he gives you credit, you feel good. Cause he doesn't dole it out all that often. It's like, if Dave doesn't call him, he's usually doing a good job. So he wrote that blog and he had the, you know, the audio from sports center. And I, I was like, Holy shit, man, he's got me front and center. And I didn't know it was blowing up back home. And then it, it did, but it, all the whole night though, you know, in the, in the Stanley cup, party you your favorite team after they won the cup. Um, just fucking that, that the whole afterglow of that, that's definitely number one. Uh, the Brady four, that was just outright hilarious because Dave got his message about, uh, that dickhead commissioner, uh, Goodell out. And it was just hilarious. Like the idea that they handcuffed themselves to each other, not, not a pole, or like something where they had to get a chainsaw or a fucking, stuff. they chained themselves to each other, which is even more hilarious. Typical Boston. That was just hilarious. Ballsy. Uh, and, the, and it got some great press for the site. And, um, uh, Let's see. I'd say uh, another personal level for me, when I interviewed Paul Rudd and uh, Jason Siegel, shit, that was probably 15 years ago when I Love You Man come out. Back when I was trying to do movie reviews as well, but Dave wasn't having it. Uh, so I went to one of the press junkets and got to interview those two. And I'm pretty sure it's like the first like celebrity actor interviews uh, Boston's ever done. So kind of selfish. What about you? I would say my number one is the Brady Four. Just because, like, the way they took complete and Barstool and Dave, like, they take over the internet on a daily basis at this point. But at the time, it was just like they fully tech took over the internet, where news news site news outlets are reporting on them, ESPN, like everyone is reporting on. And when you think about it, it's so like it's so fucking ridiculous that they chained themselves to the lobby of of the NFL headquarters. It was like. They were doing what every Patriots fan like wanted to do, and they actually did it. So it was so, so cool. And that was one of the things that was like, I want to work at this company. Like that was one of one of the moments where you're like, wait, like people are getting paid to do this. They like they just got paid to go like drive down to New York and get arrested. So like that was that was really awesome. And then I'd say personally. Uh, I think the Bruins Islanders streams that we did a, a bunch of years back, like the Borelli versus Grinelli stuff when we were down at uh, down at Borelli's down in, in the Islanders. Just personally, that was just such a fun experience. It didn't end the way we planned. But then like coming up to Boston, being at Hurricane O'Reilly's, Frankie, you know, going toe to toe with all the Boston fans. We had the whole crowd behind us. It was so much. And then R.A. with the chair. <laughs> Was lifting the chair, everyone's chanting, oh, all right, oh, all right. Like that was, that was one of the best moments of my life. Um, obviously, the Boston Live show, too, is just a truly amazing moment. But in terms of Barstool, uh, I, yeah, just the, the Brady Four is something that will always sit with me as, as my favorite moment. What about you, Merles? Yeah, my when I think about Barstool, I always remember like the the goalie challenges Dave would have in the office with the NHL players because that's the kind of stuff I was watching. And then one of my favorite videos, I'll still watch it here and there. It always gives me a chuckle when uh, Big Cat was dressed up in full Blackhawks gear. <laughs> Dave was in the Bruins full gear and they were going against each other and they're going in the store and then it started raining on them. Right. And it was just that was so funny to me. And when I think back of Barstool, I always think of that video. And, you know, personally, since I've been on board, my biggest moment is the one probably we just talked about with the coolest moment was that NYPD NYFD game, like just doing the whole broadcast, seeing everything that goes into it and, and just being a part of, you know, the interviews and then intermit intermission reports and, and just being a part of a game that big and broadcasting was really cool. I think one thing that it's crazy to say this, but I think one moment at Barstool where I was like, I took a step back and was like, this is such a fun company to work at was, a Nate at Night. Nate at Night hosted a OAR in HQ2, where OAR came into the office um, and they played a concert. They just like played a concert for the whole Barstool staff. Nate was up there playing the tambourine. But I remember just standing there because I love OAR. Marco Robert is unbelievable. But I was I just remember sitting there being like, this is so cool. Like it's so cool that we work at a company where like they just bring in OAR on a Wednesday to play like at four o'clock in the office. And there were so many memories from HQ2 that just will carry on forever. And I love that place. But yeah, what a run this has been, huh? Oh, wow. unreal. I can't wow. believe, I mean, 20 years. I think my first blog was uh, 06, 07 season, if I'm not mistaken. Unfortunately, the dev desk killed all our old blogs, so we can't find out. But uh, to think it's been 17 years, I've been, you know, with Dave and Bostel, it's, it, it's, it's fucking incredible how much it's flown by, but 
And it's so funny, RA, because I've told this story a few times and I I was such a big fan of you growing up, re- not growing up, but like reading your blogs and stuff while I was in college, at the end of high school. And it was so funny because I saw your name and I always thought you were a military guy. <laughs> so on our first, on the first day I showed up, episode two of Spit and Chicklets, I, I showed up one minute late and I remember driving there, sitting in traffic, like pulling my hair out, being like, no, this guy definitely runs on military time. He's going to be like one minute late. You are fired, you son of a bitch. I remember being so nervous. And then I walked in and met you for the first time. And I was like, this is definitely not a military guy. <laughs> Disorderly discharged, maybe. <laughs> what, other, what other things do you remember? Ah, I, I might have told you not to do. I didn't. I know I didn't tell you, don't be one minute late. What, what else could you remember? There were like two things I think I said. Uh, uh, don't don't do spell things that. wrong. You yeah. hated, yeah. you hated, yeah. hated, hated. I think it was episode five or six. I, one of our first episodes, I put Wayne Simmons with a D at the end. And uh, I spelt his last name wrong in the title. And I, I fucked it up somehow. And uh, yeah, you were pretty pissed at me that day. You were just yeah. like, don't spell shit wrong. It makes us look bad. Especially in a fucking headline, but I yeah. I stopped make cr- cracking about that a, wh- a while ago. But yeah, a couple other rules I can't remember. But you've been fucking doing all right since. G, I'll give you that. Come along, thanks, buddy. Now. I think we both have. So all right, enough of us. We got a couple young studs like I mentioned earlier coming on right now. Owen Power and Maddie Benias. Enjoy. This interview is brought to you by Chevy. Chevy is working to make charging simple. Over 110,000 charging stations across the U.S. and Canada and still growing. Us guys on Chicklets got an opportunity to check these vehicles out in person when we filmed that commercial out in Arizona with the other podcast. These things are gorgeous. The interior is nothing like I've ever seen before. Going to have to pick one of these up soon. Got to save a few more of my uh, Chicklets bucks here. But it's an unreal vehicle, especially the My Chevy app, man. Your smartphone becomes your co-pilot when you're using the My Chevrolet app with the Energy Assist. The app allows you to access vehicle information like your battery status, charging settings from anywhere, man. It's so clutch when you're driving an EV. And the Energy Assist feature intelligently plans your routes, tells you where and how long to charge up, and gives you real-time data about charging station availability, which is great for somebody like me who doesn't remember what he had for breakfast today, so sometimes I need a little queuing. And the Energy Assist feature is awesome for that. As far as home charging, three different levels are available, and Chevy electric vehicles offer great options for charging. All of them as simple as plugging in your smartphone. Learn more at chevy.com slash electric. All right, well, we got two for the price of one today. We're happy to be joined by a pair of Call the Trophy finalists who also played together at Michigan for a couple of years. One Canadian and one American, and they're only 17 days apart. Biz. Didn't know that, did you? It's a pleasure to welcome to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Buffalo Sabre, Owen Powers, and Seattle Kraken, and fellow masshole, Maddie Benez. How's Nashville, boys? <laughs> it's going well. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for having us. Yeah. Oh, Maddie's licking his wounds a little yeah, bit. He was hanging out with R.A. last night, who still has his <laughs> VIP bracelet on, so God knows what they got into. He's got into. the glow-in-the-dark stand. Stamp on the inside of his wrist. He, he's hit he up every squat. It's last good all night. week. What are you talking about? Yeah, you guys got speeches prepared or what? Uh, not not really. Oh, you're gonna wing it. That should go well. <laughs> no, I I think we're we were told to try to try to like set one up. Okay, kind of if, in case. So that's that's on the docket for today, along with a bunch of other stuff. Was there any action going into this season between you guys in terms of if one of us win it, maybe we got a little bet going? No, we, ne- we never put anything on. So. No, we didn't think about that. Honestly. You just wanted to make the club. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, we didn't think about that at all, honestly. <laughs> so you guys, you guys are attached at the hip. He mentioned, uh, you know, you, you guys, uh, 17 days apart, you guys played World Junior together. No, or, they're or, from different countries. Or, no, different countries. Sorry, uh, against each other. Uh, against each other and then Olympics against each other as well? Yeah. Okay. So there you go. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe yeah, I, I, they were in the same country. Eh? That was that was a dumb yeah yeah. You one's U.S. one's Canadian. I asked the dumb questions around what? here. These guys. World, asked ju- world Juniors was the one that got canceled. Yeah, we so played the really World Juniors. Juniors got canceled, and then World Championships we played against each other while we were at Michigan. Still, right? Yeah. Yeah. Tough to turn the hate on against each other. Or just automatic as hockey plays. No, it was fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. It's automatic. It's fun playing against like him and like we were like Ken when we were. Playing like Canada versus U.S. That was fun. There was, you're not friends when you're playing Canada versus U.S. Though. Well, I want to start with Seattle. Pretty, pretty unexpected uh, season for you guys, and obviously uh, played way better than expectations. Like, how was it with your first year playing with all those guys? You guys gelled really well, and I'm sure a very fun season. Yeah, it was. It was great. I mean, 
we I thought, you know, we were good, but um, you know, people didn't really give us that I would say respect. Um, but we I we were scrappy and we played hard, you know, we played we played a playoff game, I thought, and um so it was fun and you know, as the year went on, we we really gelled as a team in the locker room and uh, we we just had a bunch of great guys, a bunch of older guys that have been around for a while that won cups. So, uh, especially when we got to playoffs, we had we we had some you know, swagger going in. So it was, it was fun. But at, at what point, like in the season, like was it training camp? Was it 10 games in where you guys were like, wow, we're really feeling this. I think we got something here. I think it was probably like 15 to 20 games in. We started to win some games and, um, you know, our like coaches and captains were like, you know, we got to, we're like a good team. You know, we got to, we got to act like we're a good team. Like, so that was kind of, uh, that was kind of like a flip there. And, and once we did, once we started, you know, like kind of believing ourselves, we were, we started to roll. The coaching staff's like, why are you guys so surprised after every win? You could be like comfortable with winning, but you were there the year prior for what, like 10 games or so when yeah. you left school. What was the difference you saw from now? Grant, it's the end of the year. Everything's different from that team to then this year's team. I mean, the Bjorkstrand came in, right? That was yeah, we got some new, really good ads. I mean, Bjorkstrand, uh, Burkowski, um, you know, Jonesy came in, Schultze. Jonesy was, you know, Jonesy came in and won twenty something games for us, so he was great. Um, but I don't know. I think it's tough to tough to see it at the end of the year because everyone's kind of yeah. they were out of it and they were kind of like get me home for summer. So, but new year and we had a couple new guys and. Yeah, I don't know. I th I think we just gelled probably better than than they did the year before that. So any moments this year for you where, I mean, even for both you guys, um, oh, and you can go into it as well, where it's like your first full season, college is thirty eight, forty games, where you hit a wall and you kind of notice like, holy shit, like this is getting harder. It's just such a grind. Where maybe coaches sat you down. Did you have like instances of maybe ten game stretches where you just didn't feel like yourself? Uh. I felt like there wasn't too many. I mean, obviously it was a big change, but I think I kind of had to learn to almost do less a lot of times and just kind of take your rest when, when you get it. So um, I wouldn't really say I had any until like the last probably five game stretch. We, really? we were playing a ton and I, in the last game I was, I was dead. So, yeah. But, but other than that, is that right. based on college because you play on the weekends and then during the week you guys are going on the ice for two hours, you're, you're lifting weights an hour and a half and like you studying, said, you're, studying, <laughs> yeah, stu kind of, <laughs> and you're, you're almost programming yourself like that to get ready for the NHL. And then you get there and you're playing every other night. So then you just wear off. Yeah. I mean, it's a big change from going two games a week until, yeah. And, and, four three four so and the travel too. yeah the travel like, too like you fly play the next like, next night we so. had a i think it was two weeks we had we played eight games on the road right that one one trip yeah. we had eight games like that's a grind you're just living at a hotel for what two and a half weeks and then we had that eight game road trip we got back played one game at I home, hammered and then we... the lightning against you guys that game. It was my lock of the month, and they and they dummied you. I remember it. I remember. I said they're coming back from eight games oh, yeah. in Tampa and lost. Oh, yeah. They worked you guys then, over. The next night, I'm pretty sure we played Tampa, and then we might, and then I'm pretty sure we had a back to back against Edmonton in Edmonton the next oh, night. Yeah. Just and we were like, the what, do you, "What do you want us to do here? We just eight game. We're gone for two weeks. Now we play back to back, Tampa and Edmonton. Yeah, that's heavy. Yeah, that's heavy. Did you feel that? Like, I think the East is more comfy you guys are like in two separate places kind of like blue collar like <laughs> tumble you guys are like like computer uh, nerds and like fucking hipsters. Tech Valley. Like, hey, what's up, man? Yeah. Cool. Hockey. <laughs> what's that? Uh, so uh, do, you, do you enjoy the travel? I, I thought when I came became a free agent, I was like, I'll go anywhere, but not the West. Because yeah. I'm like, because of that shit. It's a you lot of travel. I mean? yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, we get it pretty easy. I feel like a yeah. lot of the trips are kind of you're in and, and you're out, you're back home. So and even every flight kind of seemed like it was an hour to two hours. So I, I think our travel for sure is a lot easier than, than everyone in the West. So, yeah. well, what was, what was, I was going to ask, what was the feeling for the Sabres going into camp yeah. last year? Cause I felt like, you know, it's been a, a rebuild time for a while, but now expectations are starting to climb. So was there a sense of confidence going into last year? Cause I really felt that you guys took that next step. Uh, yeah, I think like coming in, the team is a lot more confident than I think the year before. I mean, I wasn't there for the start, but even at the end of the year, I feel like we, we, uh, kind of built some confidence at the end of the year and then went into the next year and, um, kind of had a little bit of swagger going in. So um, I think all of us know how much potential we have as a team, and um, it's it's exciting time um, for us. 
for you uh, as a defenseman where like you know I- i'm biased as well but it's definitely a harder position for a younger guy than a forward suck up in ears <laughs> but uh <laughs> besides like the obvious like mcdavid crosby was there one guy in your mind you're like fuck he was hard to play against like a guy you were like this is this is like superstar level in the nhl uh i don't know i mean i mean there's so many of them like yeah i didn't know if there was one that just roasted you that just sticks in your mind <laughs> I, you guys have big rivalry against like toronto and stuff right yeah toronto's good rivalry, those guys like, like matthews marner some of those, guys. those guys yeah they're they're pretty good my first game was actually against them so it's pretty cool to 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 play against them but i mean those two guys you you go up against them and you don't realize how good they are until you're actually playing against them so it's yeah. it's pretty cool yeah, I, I was gonna actually like I, I was gonna say the same thing about you. It's harder like as a goalie than you look at the fence yep. and then and then go up to forward. But all of a sudden you're thrown in that first line center role. Like what was I mean? What was that like? Those types of line matches in your first full year. I mean, you had to have been going up against some big dogs and, and having to adjust on the fly. Yeah, I mean it was it was definitely a learning curve. Um, <laughs> yeah, we you know there's some nights where. You know, it goes well, and it's fun playing against, you know, the good top lines, but, and, you know, you get offense from it because they're, they're buzzing around, they're making plays, and, and you can kind of turn it back on them, but, um, yeah, know, they're cheating a little sometimes. Yeah, a little bit, but there's, there, there were some nights where I got back to the bench, I was like, holy cow, it's going to be a long <laughs> night. <laughs> I was between the benches and Pitt, they're playing Seattle. And I like had to hold the mute button down. Him and Sid were going at it. No, really? No, I wasn't. I wasn't you going were at Sid. Taking it. Was, you were taking it. <laughs> he was, he was, sorry, sir. Sorry. <laughs> he was. Yeah. Sorry, Mister Crosby. No, no. We were just. We were just competing. Just battling. Would yeah. you stick him? Do you have Do you have a dirty side of your game that that people no, should know about? No, we were just. We were just battling. I don't think. Uh, I don't know. I think he. I think he took a penalty. I don't think he liked that. It was. I think I might have fell or something. He took a penalty and Maybe he didn't golf, like that penalty. So uh, was he was letting me know. And no, it was. It was nothing. He's. It's fun playing against. Him. I was like, oh, this is so cool. He's yelling at me. <laughs> 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 so no, it was. It was fun. But yeah, no. The, coming back to the playing playing against those lines, like we we had that Edmonton. We played one night, and I think I was dash four in like the first period or second period and it was like i came out of the bench i was like i don't want to be on the ice right now so those are those are those are nights you kind of learn from so i was thinking about the fan bases like yours is new right but for you like buffalo like they're just dying like their their regional hockey numbers on tv are like through the roof like number one in the league forever even when they've been so brutal so they're dying for you guys to like get going the eichel stuff's out of the way next year can you feel that in, in town yeah it's I, a small city really right no for sure i mean like even just this year compared to the games i played last year like the the fans were, were so much better so much yeah. louder in the building and even just kind of going around around the city people will stop and, and say stuff how excited they are about the team so um it, it's pretty cool to kind of have them engage again and um kind of have them excited just slamming people through tables on their front lawn <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> just like just They're light themselves loaded. on fire, slamming through tables. Oh, we had uh, your captain, Kyle Oposo, on uh, about a year or so ago. What, what's he like as a captain? He seems like a type of guy you just want to go balls to the wall for. Just in the interview we had with him, he just seems like an awesome guy. Yeah, no, I mean, he's, I think you could ask anyone on the team and they don't have enough good stuff um, to say about him. Um, like, he, he's one of the best guys ever. I think every guy has so much respect for him. He's, he's so such a big part of our team and um, just kind of keeping us all um, together and collected. Um, so I don't, I don't really know where we'd be, um, without having a guy like him. So he's, he's huge and obviously he just signed with us. So it's, um, it's pretty exciting. That boys must have been pumped. He re-upped, huh? Yeah, no, everyone, everyone was, was super, super happy. So, um, like I said, he, he's great. So were there any moments, maybe him or, or another like veteran player kind of took you aside this year just to talk about how the year is going for you? Like looking out for, I mean, obviously the top prospect, one of the top players on the team in their first year. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say there's any time where they like took me aside and had like a long meeting, but like he would he would come up to me and if I was struggling a few games, he, he would just kind of give me a little confidence and, and say something. But I think you kind of go around and, and every guy's like that. If, yeah. if they see someone struggling or... Um, kind of not being not themselves in the room they'll they'll come up and, and make sure you're doing fine so um i think that just kind of speaks for for the locker room we have and, and the guys in it i think for both of you i, I guess the question I, I we always hear oh just trying to get better you know just work on my game get better <laughs> what's one thing after this season that you could look at this summer like what do you 
what did you see like holy shit you know that was that was a good year but what's something you guys got to get better at or is there something you're targeting in the off season um i mean for me the biggest thing's scoring in my shot i mean I had a, Do you have a muffin? Muffin, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I mean, I had four goals this year, so. It's not bad. Yeah, it's not terrible for a rookie. What do you, a like, are you a 1E guy? You're more more of a, like, a Wade Red and Rister guy? Yeah, I mean, just kind of. Just I'm, getting them through? Yeah. He's like sneaky through, silky. Just, like, he likes to walk in and rip them five hole. That's what he oh, does. Yeah. <laughs> he's going glove, but it goes no, five no, hole. No, 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 he's, exactly. He's silky. But, yeah, that's, I mean, that was a big thing for me. I mean, just kind of putting more velocity on and just kind of being more comfortable in those areas because I think I, I had a lot of chances and. Um, I think it took me 50 games to, to score my first one, so that was kind of the biggest thing. Well, you're you're in Mississauga in the summer. Yeah, yeah, I I live there, and then kind of Burlington is where I work out and and skate skate in Oakville. So I, I'm always interested in, in guys that end up choosing college from from Canada. Like how how was that for you turning down the OHL and, and things like that? Like did you always know you wanted to play college hockey? Uh, I mean. Growing up, no, but I think as soon as I kind of went for my first visit and, and saw what it was like, it was, for me, a no-brainer. I mean, um, especially the late birthday to be able to yeah. to go play in college for, for my draft year and um, kind of have that extra time to develop. It, it was it was an easy decision for me. It was, the OHL was kind of never even an option. So you accelerated high school to graduate early? No, because in Canada, it's, you just go by birth year. So. Oh, okay. So I graduated and then on time and... First year of, of university was. Yeah, was, they'll sneak you a few yeah. extra credits in Canada too if you're good enough. If you yeah, can snap like, a tape, he's like, tape. After the visit, it was like, he got game. Um, <laughs> Jesus Shuttlesworth. So yeah, I, was, I committed. <laughs> so w- what was it about Michigan when you guys went on your visit that you're just like, this is the spot for us? And, and, and are they typically okay with knowing that you're going to be a one and done type player? Like, do they, do, is there any pushback on that? Like going there for one season and then you're on the, you're, you're back playing pro. Uh, I mean, I think, I think they're good there. I mean, I, they want their guys to go play in the NHL. Yeah, so I don't think they're like, well, sometimes I don't programs think they're get poopy it. pants, don't they? No, if you, if you just go one I don't, and I don't think they're, they're like that, especially, you know, the coaches there, like they, they want the best for you and they're just like, you know, if it's the right decision for you to go, then go. But, you know, we want you to stay and, you know, develop as much as you can before you do go because they, they understand how it is. Like, you know, making the jump is tough and you don't want to do it. <clears throat> A lot of guys do it too early and then and that's no good. So Well, we talked to uh, – who was the Quinnipiac coach? Um, but he was saying, like, there's different programs, right, where programs are recruiting guys that they know will be there four years, yeah. the older guys, and then Michigan, BU, they're looking for the top player that, that may end up leaving. But but you stayed after you got drafted, correct? Yeah, both of us did. Yeah. Oh, oh, you stayed. All right, yeah. so so was there a decision to be made there? Did the team maybe say, hey, it's up to you? Or or personally, were you just like, I, I think I need one more year? Yeah, I wanted to go back. I mean, we yeah. were in COVID, too. Our freshman year, we played, like, 30 games, maybe not even. Um, I know. I think we played like 24 games. Didn't have any fans. So didn't experience it. Yeah, yeah. Didn't experience it. I mean, I was, I was small, like little, I mean, literally than I am now. So, <laughs> but, um, so there, it wasn't really a question for me. I wanted to go back and it was way great for me. So developing wise, I heard you're, you make some world famous garlic bread. Is that true? I do. How do you know hey, that? Hey, it's a garlic bread. Hey, uh, yeah. who, who taught you to cook? Or, 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 or I mean, I, not, I guess it's not really cooking, but it's pretty simple. Bake? Yeah, yeah. It's simple. I don't know. My, my family's bit, like my mom and uh, grandma and grandpa, they're all uh, really big cooks and we're really Italian. So they would always be cooking everything for, for dinners. And, you know, if we have everyone over, it's like a 10 course meal. Like You're a Sunday everything. dinner family guy? Oh, uh, we, we, we were when we grew up, like we would always have dinners, like family dinners. Um, and then I figured I was like, oh, I'll get something. So I was always the garlic bread guy. <laughs> I just make garlic bread for everyone. Yeah. You invite the guys over for dinner. It's just straight up garlic. Bread. <laughs> like, what the fuck is I this? always all- make it now too. I, that's my. <laughs> Hacksaw's like, you can eat to. some of it. Is that it, your dude? pregame meal? Part of it? <laughs> No. Hey, no. way to go. You make toast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, bu- I butter bread. <laughs> well, yeah, garlic bread sounds more Call fancy, right? <laughs> Are you a gravy family or a sauce family? Gravy. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a big uh, divide the Italian community. I know. It? I know. My cousins are sauce. Okay. Oh, what do you cook? You cook anything? You a mac and cheese guy? Craft, craft dinner? No, I mean steak and eggs, basically. That's about it, but... Um, He's on the paleo. Steak and legs in <laughs> Nashville. <laughs> no, no. I, that's, I don't cook much, but... It's basically steak, and then if my girlfriend's there, she'll she'll make basically anything. So it's it's good that she's able to come down quite a bit. So it's nice to kind of have home cooked meal. 
take you, take you under your wear. So you're not a ring? chef's every day, just parming everything up in Buffalo. <laughs> no, eh? no, no. Yeah, but we get like meals all the time. Like we At barely rink, ever have right? to cook. Yeah, we get yeah. breakfast there and lunch after we skate. And then you guys take to go home like they all yeah. do. You guys are cheap. <laughs> 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 and, then we'll, and then we'll like cook at night. I mean, I didn't do much cooking this year, but. We like we ate out a good amount. Remember? Yeah, we don't have Fruit Loops and the cereal thing. With remember that? Yeah, exactly. Fruit Gary, Loops. So you put Gary it Roberts a- got traded to our team, <laughs> and he's like, he saw me eating Fruit Loops with chocolate milk. He's like, what the fuck? <laughs> he's like, all of a sudden we had like a new chef and food. <laughs> um, besides these two bling watches, you guys are rocking. Yeah, you guys, bu- you guys buy anything else when you signed? Get a car or anything? Uh, no. My first purchase was like a new a Xbox. Oven. <laughs> a new, a new toaster Xbox. oven. Oh. <laughs> That's it. It's like I got a new uh, blender to make shit. I didn't buy. It. I haven't bought anything. I barely like. I bought some new clothes and stuff, but uh, I got like a couch. That was probably the biggest purchase. Couches are expensive. What well, these guys oh, had to yeah. take a. These guys had to take a pay cut coming from Michigan, so they got to be smart <laughs> with their money. Right, so I, I I respect that. What about you, Owen? You, you you don't look like the type of guy to waste your money. No, I mean, I haven't really bought anything, so it's I'm like Maddie. I I don't really spend my money. I don't. So of all those Michigan guys who are playing in the NHL, who's the spender? Who's the spender of the group? Hughes, Brisson, Brisson, of course. Oh, because this old man's got a bunch. He knows he's gonna get in the end, right? <laughs> he's spending Sid's money. He loves yeah. to spend it. <laughs> um, I always, when I think of ha- your team, I think of Hackstall and how serious he is. And his does goatee. He, does he ever smile? Like, does he ever? Does he ever joke around with the guys? Yeah. He seems so fucking intense all the time. <laughs> no, he's he's intense when he needs to be, and then, um, you know, outside the rink, he. He's just like us, you know, he's a normal guy and uh, really, really nice. And he, he jokes around when we're like practice days and, and stuff. But I, I you know, it was, it was good for us. I thought it was, you know, he was intense when we needed to be intense and, and before games and during games. But, um, you know, after the games, he was, he was pretty light. And so, yeah. yeah, it was good. It was a good mix. Yeah, the only other thing I think of is that the, probably the worst mascot in league history in oh, Bowie. Yeah. Like you guys must, you, you, have you guys had a meeting about that and maybe switching things up? I know you got the PR girl in here. She's probably not happy with me chirping buoy, but is it like, what is that? <laughs> what the, what is that fucking thing? Um, it's like, it's, there's a, there's a bridge in Seattle and below the bridge. He's a troll or that's something? That's where he, that's legit where he lives. And it's like a Seattle, like, um, kind of like. Staple? Staple, I would say is, is the thing on the gnome on the bridge or it is um <laughs> uh so yeah they they made that and honestly i get the kids love it so the, all the like all my trainers said that their kids like absolutely love buoy i so, think eberly said the, the opposite seaweed? i thought eberly said that his kids were scared of it uh yeah probably <laughs> i don't know i i that, that was from i heard what i heard from my trainers they said the kids their kids they're loved being it, brainwashed so. by the organization is what i think's <laughs> happening have you ever seen the actual troll under the bridge? Have you checked that out? At no, all? I haven't. No. no? I, I think it's a fictional story. I think it's, story, I think it's right? made up. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, I don't no, think it's, it's an actual, like, it's, a, it's yeah. like a. No, I'm pretty it's sure like it's real. Or something. No, it's yeah, a, if you oh, look that yeah. up, it's like, yeah, it's there's like, like a little sculpture or something. Troll yeah. under the bridge. Okay. Yeah. Like from the movie Le- The Leprechaun? <laughs> like looking like a little bit like that? Uh, no, it's, it's huge. It's like a 30 foot, like, high, like, log structure or something. It's kind of real, like the Loch Ness Monster. And the, and, the, and the whole the whole basis of the yeah, Kraken what's going team. On in Seattle. <laughs> what do you got, Arnie? I, I want to ask about like maybe a moment. Like I remember lining up for a face off with like Yager, who you guys just interviewed. That's kind of, that was I was like, that's oh, cool. Shit, that's Yager. oh, you're welcome to the NHL moment. Well, I was like, I was like, oh, or like I took a run at Lidstrom and like Chelios is saying he's gonna kill me. I'm like, holy shit, this is Chelios, real. I'm here. What the hell? <laughs> Did you guys have that? I know you guys got a little taste last year or the year before coming into the season, but anyone you came up against where you're like wow you're kind of stuck looking a little bit I, yeah between, i mean for me it's, it's crosby i think like yeah. a lot of guys i mean growing up he was kind of my guy i i love watching him so it's be able to go out and, and play against him i well, it was pretty cool the first time. Did you want to be a forward at some point, or is that? Was yeah, that you didn't just... have a D man as your guy. No, I, I, I don't know why. I just kind of, I just love <laughs> Crosby. Like I was always, yeah, I, I actually wanted to be a goalie all growing up, so I don't really know you how. Nineteen in Pittsburgh in two thousand seven. Yeah, I feel like our era was like, like us growing up. Our age group was like always Sid and Ovi. Yeah, and then the younger 
kids now, like younger than us, is probably like they grew and up with like McDavid and Matthews, and, Matthews, and we yeah. were Sid and Ovi. So it was always like for me, it was Sid. And then any of the Bruins guys I played against, I was like, nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We played against Lucic. I was like, I got oh, hit. Yeah. I was like, I text my dad. They're like, yo, I just got hit by Lucic. <laughs> Did, did either one of you guys get run over this year? Did you take a big hit? Um, Did anyone get you good? Yeah, I mean, not not like one that really hurt, but I remember in Washington, first game against Ovechkin. He got you. I think it was like the first shift I kind of tried to to get a bump on him, and he just ran me right over. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny. So, Yeah, I got I, – I don't think it was anything that bad. It was that one game in Dallas in the playoffs, I got hit like – 10 times and I I'm, I feel like I'm not usually a guy that gets gets hit a lot but I was I was getting crushed in the boards and <laughs> so that was that was tough it was oh, I forget well, his it was the big D what's the big D on Dallas's name oh Alex no Alexis on your team uh you guys have Hawk is it Hawk and Paw yeah it's Hawk and Paw yeah. he was he was He's all huge. over me that night shooter. They, yeah. had a, they had a big uh, big nasty decor you we always talk about how like playoff time like the, the the pace elevates the physicality elevates like for you as a, as a younger player did you really notice that in, in your first experience in playoffs or because you guys had such a good group where you felt that took a little bit of that that spice off of it yeah i, I mean i thought i it definitely was more intense especially playing against colorado like in that building that was just crazy yeah. and then you got you know mckinnon is just flying around everywhere and you're trying to just catch them so <clears throat> they were they were really tough i mean both them and dallas were tough to play against but um it definitely got was really intense especially like the first three games because everyone's kind of pumped up um and then as the game started going on more and more like you just everyone just gets tired like you're, yeah, you you're getting hit little. more and everyone yeah you're right it settles in a little bit more and that's when that's when i felt like it got started to get a little easier but those first couple of games were especially on the road were were tough and so fast-paced so what was the most surprising thing about your rookie? Eight? Well, I, I asked both of you. It's like something you didn't, totally didn't expect that kind of come out of nowhere. I don't really rookie know. party. <laughs> and how <laughs> much like, that cost? You? That was probably your big expense. Is that, rookie yeah, party. That probably is my yeah. biggest. What'd you have to pay? I think we got off a little easy. I don't. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was it was Canadian dollars. So oh, oh my god, oh. <laughs> thirty five cent like, yeah, exchange. Eighteen laughing. bucks. Yeah. We went to Subway. Yeah, Canadian tire dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we interviewed another teammate, as Rasmus Dahlin. He seems uh, like quite the character. He must be a, a hilarious in the locker room, huh? Yeah. No, I'm. I wouldn't say he's like the loudest guy, but he's he's definitely. Um, <clears throat> when he gets going, it's it's funny. So, um, he, he's good to have. He's sneaky, like. He's sneaky, like rough too, like cheap. Like he'll give you the stick, eh? Hey? Oh yeah, like you watch him. Like, who did he nasty. drop the shoot? Yeah, he, well, they he, got he, the he Hamilton guys game. Out too, yeah, in the really? Hamilton game, I think it was him and Matthews going at one. Yeah, they did. It? And then oh, yeah. this year, I think against San Jose, he someone on their bench was chirping for being soft. The next shift, he went out and just killed one of their guys. Really? So he he plays with an edge, and yeah. he's always kind of. I didn't realize how big he was when we interviewed him. Yeah, like six four. Who did yeah, he, he lay? He laid someone out the shirt. It was uh, it was that was the San Jose. I forget who it was, but he like killed them. Yeah. 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 At your exit meeting this year, like what did Don Granado say to you just about like just getting ready this summer and things like that? Or was there anything in particular? Uh, he was happy with your year, I'm guessing. Yeah, like he was happy with my year, but I think it was kind of what I said. Like, I think them too is a lot. My shot was kind of the biggest thing that yep. everyone's kind of saying, but I think for the most part, it's just kind of go back, get stronger, um, faster, kind of like like everyone. Bigger, faster, stronger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you have a lot of guys around like Mississauga or whatever where, that are NHL guys you're skating with in the summer? Is there a good crew? Yeah, I mean, I, I, got, a, I got a pretty good group where there's probably five or six of us that, that skate, but I think you could go anywhere and there's going to be guys yeah. skating. So I'm, I'm lucky we're in... In Toronto and kind of that area, there's there's so many good skates that you, that you can get out and go to. Are you guys both like because it's changed where when we played like playoffs end, skates are off till August. I don't know, tenth, maybe maybe a little earlier. Yeah. Are you skating all summer? or Are you putting them away for a while? I I try to put them away for oh as long as I can, especially because like I try to like try to put on weight, and that's so tough. If I'm working out and skating. Carl, okay. <laughs> help me that early in the, <laughs> that early in the summer. So I'll try. I don't know when it's it's gotten later at every like as as I've gotten older, 
the amount really? of time I'm skating in the summer is less and less. Just trying. I think to a lot of guys weight. skate like you were talking about now. that with your with your brother yeah, and how a lot guys of these don't work out as much. They just skate all every day. Yeah, they're on the ice for two three hours, yeah. and it's hard. Like you said, it's hard to to build strength and really yeah. keep it on because you're burning so many calories yeah. when you're out there. Like the first time I used to be like more of a skate a lot in the summer, and then the one summer I. Excuse me, I went to world championships and I like had a high ankle sprain and so I couldn't skate all summer. And so I just worked out. I didn't skate the entire summer. It was the year I was going into my sophomore year at Michigan. And since that, since then, like I was able to like put on some weight and muscle. And after that, I pretty much like slowed down how much I skate in the summers uh, until like July and August or late July and August come when you start got to kind of ramp it up for for uh camp yeah it's nice getting the mental break too yeah and just oh, staying absolutely. away man going to the rink every day could be just such a grind yeah oh and for you like with your size you're still such a good skater was that always the case or was were you kind of slow at one point and it became like a big time skill for you um yeah it definitely wasn't the case when i was younger i mean was there any person that helped like individually like one power skating instructor yeah no i uh i worked with the girl dom braid kind of all growing up and and she helped a lot so she kind of got my my technique done. What age did you start doing that? I, I don't know. I was young. My mom worked at the rink that she skated at, so it was, I somehow got in like when I was pretty young, and I was I was lucky enough to do it kind of all the way up. And then I think when I went to junior, I, I had like good kind of technique. It's just my feet were a little slower, and then as I, you get stronger, yeah, I think as I filled into my body, and and in Chicago where I played junior, I, the the skills guys there did a ton of kind of footwork stuff with me that I think really helped me and. Um, Kind of brought the me Chicago through. Steel. Yeah, we who did we just Fantilli. have? Fantilli. Yeah, Fantilli, Fantilli talked about you actually, like your path. Yeah, to leave because like and, we were talking about families that sell their their other kid. Yeah, so that they could play in the GTHL. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but just how much that organization invests into their players, where they provide these insane resources. It seems like kind of like the Michigan before going to Michigan, where you're just in this like unreal pipeline of being developed. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I think. I mean. When we Michigan, Why are you laughing? Why are you yeah, laughing? We would have some, so both many got fights. paid there too. Oh, probably. Lord, yeah. So yeah. many fights about whether Chicago or NTP was the better route. Yeah, I just which one developed players better? Because yeah, yeah, which there's a ton of Chicago guys in because there was like they're trying to argue the Chicago Steel versus the National Development Program. Yes, no. I want to hear this debate. I don't even know if it was that, but we had a bunch of guys that it came from like, Chicago and then a bunch of U.S. guys. Had, yeah, oh, who Matthews and Kane? No. <laughs> But Come we, on, we debated like the the, the kind of like how they have it set up like yeah yeah it, it was, was so yeah it was debating on like he was debating pretty much like that how Chicago develops like all of their players basically and and saying it's better than what the program does yes from what from slander. a from a um, like the amount of games thank you're you. playing <laughs> thank you oh he didn't give you a good enough reason no he was we would we would argue I don't even know what it is because like you're in like a league six. and they're like not in a league and they just random what do you do you no they they play in the same, We're in the same league as them yeah. But then you also get to play college teams and you play international oh, tournaments. They're yeah. playing like the Dubuque Fighting Saints on Friday <laughs> night. It's like, we're not going to do this right now. Although Chicago, yeah, Fantilli was telling us like the money they spend. And now it is for sure like the powerhouse program there. So they went to you and were able to bring you in or did you have to get drafted by them? Because like, why wouldn't have another team picked you? No, so I got, I got drafted by them and then they kind of like change everyone like every, the owner kind of fired everyone and brought new guys in so i don't know i think the new guys drafted me and then they came at me really hard to go because it was never i was i was originally just going to play at home in like the oj the the tier two league there yep. and um when i got drafted there they they came at me pretty hard to go and i went down and saw it and and loved it so i ended up going there so when when did you start um, realizing or, or understanding, like, I, I could go first overall? Was it, like, a year or two prior with some guys, or was it later on? Like, I don't really remember in terms of, like, when everyone knew you were going to be the first overall pick. When did that get into your mind? And did it affect you at all? I, I don't think so. I mean, we had so many guys kind of up in that same situation where, what, we had three guys in the top five that year, and, um, and Luke. Luke that came in the next year. So, I mean... I, I I think both of us were lucky. We we were all kind of going through the same thing, but I don't think there's really a time where I was like, oh, I could actually go first overall until kind of later in the year. Really? Um, but I think even that summer, it was kind of everything was up in the air and um, kind of anyone could, can go anywhere. I don't know. I mean, I think 
you probably knew during the year, you know. Dur- yeah, yeah, during like I think you kind of hear about it. Yeah, you, you hear everyone talking. It's like right. Right. <laughs> Bob McKenzie's like number one. You're like, oh, <laughs> sweet, okay, cool. So yeah. What about the development team too? Like the guys that you played with there, pretty good crop of yeah, we talent were, coming out of yeah, there. Yeah, we were and the coach there and everything. I loved it at the development program. That was kind of where like I feel like hockey kind of became more like comes a job a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. A good job. one though. Yeah, I think like for me, like it was always like school and hockey when I grew up, just because like my family was like that. Like my parents were Cornell and my sister and like I went to Milton Academy so like nerd fest yeah <laughs> so so like it was school and hockey and then once I went to the program that's when it changed to like hockey oh like I might be able to like play hockey that was never like a thing I, to, always to earn a living that was the first time it clicked for you yeah it was always like oh I'm gonna play hockey to get to college and I want to play college hockey like I want to play at BC that was kind of like the end goal like you can ask my my parents we never were like Oh, we're, he's gonna be playing in the NHL. Yeah. So it was never, never like that. And then once I got there, uh, it kind of flipped. And like, at, like Apper, we we had we had a solid team. I mean, we weren't we weren't great, but uh, Apper was huge um, for me at the program. So and then the guys there were were awesome and practicing and yeah. grinding with them every was day. Caulfield, Zegras. They were the older team. My they team was not team. as good as them, but yeah. we we grinded. So so like when did. Like, as you mentioned BC, right? Local kid, it's BU or BC. And when did you decide Michigan, I guess, maybe being out there? And then, like, for you as well, like, you're getting recruited by everyone. How did you guys decide to... Did you know each other beforehand where you're all talking, like, let's do this together? No, I mean... Yeah, mine was crazy. Didn't want to go to Michigan. So. <laughs> I was on I don't blame I was you. going you're to Harvard. Boston. I was going to Harvard. Oh, is it because they canceled the season? Yeah, I was, like, I, w- I was like doing my pre-tests for Harvard and, like, writing my, like essay for like what English class I had to get in like two weeks before the school started or three weeks and then they sent out a note and they were like hockey season's canceled only freshmen on are gonna be on campus stay hot Ivy League so then I was like kind of like I I don't want to I didn't want to go back to the USHL I wanted to be in college so I started to look back around and I'd never looked outside of Boston pretty much and then I went and looked at Michigan and I was like this is pretty great. I never, like, I didn't, I went and visited with my parents, didn't walk in the rink, didn't walk in a single building, just walked around the campus. I was like... Alone or with the coach, at least? Just, just me and my my parents. And we walked around, we were like, this is pretty great. So, and we knew, like, they had a great class going in too, so that helped because we we came from the program where you're playing with a lot of good guys. And so we knew that would be that would be good too so that's kind of why suck on that happened well boys we, we're getting uh, pinged over here we got to let you yeah, guys these go. guys are yeah. big Those, dogs yeah. well congratulations to both you guys honestly yeah. it's, yeah. it's uh it's really <laughs> i ask every buffalo guy who's got the best wings in buffalo i, I don't know i there's a place uh I just told you. yeah you, you, i've never tried that place but Duffs. He's Ooh, no. Oh. Rose doesn't like no, that. He's disgusting. But he, he went to Chickles to Cathlon, so he can't even. Speak. I went to Duff's when I was like really young. That's when one of one of my buddies' dads grew up in uh, grew up in Buffalo, and that's where he took us. What's your spot? Bar Barville North. Okay, Bar, I, Bar I've North. never tried that, but a lot of people have said that place is good. So, so we got to get you maybe trying some wings in Buffalo. But honestly, all amazing, he eats amazing. steak and eggs. He said that. Yeah, and, and uh, garlic <laughs> bread when he's with his buddy. But um, congrats to both you guys. Amazing year. Good luck with the awards, and uh, we appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having us. Thank thanks, you. boys. Thanks, boys. All right, before we go any further, here's a word from our friends at Body Armor. Spit and Chicklets is brought to you by Body Armor. From sports drinks to sports water, Body Armor keeps us hydrated all day long. Got some right here. And whether we're talking, watching, or even playing sports, Body Armor is our go-to choice. It's real hydration, real ingredients packed with electrolytes, vitamins, and nothing artificial. Body Armor has great taste and flavors as well. Strawberry banana is my favorite. Also got blue raspberry, tons of others. I'm sure you're going to fancy one of them. And the best athletes in the world. Hydrate with body armor like Ronald Acuna Jr., Christian McCaffrey, Alex Morgan, and the latest athlete to join the team, Joe Burrow, Cincinnati baby. My favorite, like I said, strawberry banana, but there's tons of them, man. You're going to find something you like, and if you're not, take a little bit of the water. Late night recordings, boom, clutch. Comes in on the clutch all the time. Hockey games, chicklets cup, whatever you're doing, make sure you're hydrating with body armor, whether it be the water or one of their lovely flavors. They're available in stores nationwide, or you head on over to the body armor store on Amazon and get yours today.
Big thanks to the Michigan guys for jumping on with us. We did that down in Nashville. We had a lot of fun the night before. So, Maddie walked out of the room. We kind of had a little chuckle before the interview. But uh, a pair of great kids, man. And like we said, but with Owen Powell, Buffalo, built for the long haul here. Those fans should be very excited, especially with uh, Devin Levi starting up this year. Hopefully, he be in the status crease. But anyways, back to the show. G, if you know what a time it is, baby. Grinds my gears. You know, something always pisses me off somewhere. I start keeping notes now because fucking this world's crazy. And it's brought to you by Big Deal Bruin. Go to bigdealbrewing.com slash find out. Find out how close Big Deal Brew is to you. Should be pretty close. We're in a shitload of provinces, a bunch of states, and we keep going and going. So once again, bigdealbrewing.com slash find uh, Boy, Milan Lucic was pitching with a Big Deal Brew over the weekend, if I'm not mistaken. So all right, a while back, G, you know, I blogged and vented about like fucking Great Danes uh, sitting in coach on airplanes. This, this is animal related, but it's not that. And obviously, I'm not referring to animals that fall under the ADA, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. But like... When did it become the fucking norm for pet owners to just bring their pets fucking wherever they go inside indoors, man? I don't get it. For 2,000 years or where people just didn't willy-nilly bring it. And it's, it, I don't, it annoys me. I don't fucking hate dogs. I like dogs. It's just when I'm in a supermarket, legit, swear to God, two weeks ago, my wife, I looked over. I seen a fucking furry head. A fu- it was either a fucking weasel, a mongoose, or, or a fucking ferret. I'm like, it's a borderline road. I know a ferret's not a road. I was like, you like, wh- why are you bringing this in, a, in the goddamn supermarket? I mean, especially all this fucking food, produce. Uh, Vegas, we were out there. Where we stay in a pretty nice hotel. See a guy with a leash. He's dragging the dog because he's looking forward. He doesn't realize he's dragging it. The dog's trying to shit. So he stops, turns around. Dog drops a heat stick right in the lobby. It's like, bro, what the fuck? Like, I, I didn't stay to see if he cleaned it up, but it's like, like, I don't know, man. I, I just fucking, there's reason why humans and their animals. I don't think they should be willy nilly brought in. And the thing is, I blame the fucking businesses more than anybody. It's like, they allow it. Just say, hey, buddy, fucking no pets. It's been a sign on every convenience store for the last fucking 500 years. But now, I don't know, man. Like, do you notice it, G, like, just animals, like, where you didn't have seen them maybe 10, 20 years ago? Yeah, you I mean, I it? have a dog. I'm a dog owner. Yeah. I, I, I bring my dog virtually, like, everywhere. I don't even think twice about bringing it into a store right now. But I will say, R.A., like, a supermarket, I'm not bringing my dog in there. Just because, like, I don't want my dog, like, sniffing the fruit and, and stuff that people could eat and put their hands on. I don't want to have my dog be a burden to them. But like, for example, this morning, I went and got a coffee. I brought my dog into the coffee store and the coffee store loves it because they have like a big thing of treats where they give the dogs treats. You kind of have to like play the vibe out, I think. Right. I'm not bringing my dog into a restaurant, supermarket, a bar. But I mean, if I'm just stopping into a convenience store, grabbing some milk, getting a coffee, I'll bring my dog in there quick. But yeah, I mean, ferrets and people carrying around ferrets and like weird fucking animals like that. That's a whole fucking story for a different day because like I lived in my last building and I can run the video here now, but I was in the elevator one time and this lady came in and she had two 80-year-old parrots on her fucking shoulders. (laughs) And she's like, you want to pet them? And I'm like, sure, I'll pet them. And she's like, well, they do bite. And I'm like, well, so am I petting the parrots or am I getting my finger bitten off? But like, what are we doing here? So yeah, weird pets freak me the fuck out. I think that's that grinds my gears. But in terms of bringing your dog places, I think you just got to kind of play it by ear. But I do hear you with the supermarket. Right. And if a business decides they're pet friendly, and that, that's fine. Like, it's not, you know, people are aware of it. And it's not even me, to be honest. It's like, well, first off, the germ factor. These animals, that, you know, lick their buttholes and other buttholes. I don't want them around my fucking bananas and fucking mangoes. But it's like allergies. People are allergic to animals. And then some people are just flat out afraid of dogs. They got bit as a kid or they're just fucking afraid of them. It's, I don't know. I just think there's better reasons to not have have them inside any animal than fucking outside but it's are you are you not a dog guy like no, do you like dogs i like dogs i swear to god i don't i don't like run from dogs or kick them when no one's looking i'm like that i legit <laughs> like dogs I, i've had them when i was a little kid what? i just it hasn't been fucking i haven't had a desire to have one now i mean the same reason i don't want kids just too much maintenance but i get i mean i get it i know the appeal of dogs they're, they're great animals i i mean i think it's great actually fiona apple um uh the, the singer she just actually postponed her tour she was supposed to go to South America, and she wrote this, you know, wicked, heartfelt, long post. I don't know if it was on Twitter or the gram, explaining like I've had this dog for fourteen years. Like, I mean, it goes into like depth of like why why she had to basically postpone her tour. She was very upfront and honest. Like, if you read the headline, it might sound obnoxious, like oh, singer uh, postpones tour for animal. But when you read the thing, you get tears yeah. in your eyes, and it's like, have you ever seen Scott shit. Van Pelt's one final word on his dog, where he like oh yeah. pays pays tribute to his dog at the end of a sports yeah. center? It's impossible to watch that without crying. 
absolutely, man. I, 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 yeah, I know I do sound like a, a Grinch, but it, it just, you know, and I'm an old guy of the show. It's just something you never saw ever. And now it's like commonplace to like people like, see, you know, whether they're dogs, cats, whatever, man. It's like, I don't know. That's why we got the fucking doors to keep them out. Uh, also, too, people got to use their fucking little tag, tag on here. Got to use their leashes, man. I was walking through a, the public park, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, a little late, maybe having a beer in the park. And one of those like genetically engineered yuppie dogs comes bombing over. And the owner's calling his name out, not like, hey, Skippy, come here. It was like, Skip, Skip. I was like, what the fuck's he yelling that loud for? And it looked like a cross between like a poodle and a Great Dane. It was giant, but it was a poodle looking thing. And the fucking thing growled at me when he walked by. I was like, you know, I was like, holy shit. I was like, and that, I was like, he nipped at me. I'd punt that fucking a Chelsea, man. It's like, put your dog on a leash. Like, I like dogs, but if the motherfucker bites me, it's going to be payback. I'm like, and so I didn't say nothing. I must have been in a good mood or chill, or whatever. But, you know, keep your fucking dogs on a leash. Uh, last but not least, especially in the city, Clean up after your fucking dogs. That's probably the worst thing about shitty dog owners, is when, no pun intended, is when they drop one on the fucking cement and they leave it there. Uh, actually, it's kind of another funny story I got to give you. I actually got shit on on the way to Vermont by my brother's dog two weeks ago when we were going up there. Legit. And he's Luke. His name's Luke, ironically. He thinks he's as tough as Luke. Little white, I don't know if it's a Bashan Frise or whatever, sitting there. And I've known, he knows me for nine years, whatever. And he was kind of antsy, whatever. All of a sudden, I hear my brother go, no, Luke, what the fuck? And like, I looked down. I thought like the sun hit my leg or something because I did feel a little warmth there. I looked down and it wasn't like one of those little dog shits you can clean up with. The qu- it was fucking, he had a bad stomach. I was like, motherfucker. And I was like too shocked <laughs> to be mad. I was like, Luke, like fucking all. So it, so the seat slanted. So it rolls down. So now I got on my leg, my shorts. It catches my oh. box and my t-shirt. <laughs> I get fucking sh- sitting there. My brother has pulled over to New Hampshire. We're in the park lot. I'm like, Paul, don't park here, anybody. I, I got to get fucking changed. So I roll down the window, open the door, and I'm like, I got to make sure I don't want to look like a fucking pedo with my box of shorts. I had to take my shorts, my shirt off, go to the trunk, get clothes out, back in the car, and change everything. And I sat in the back seat like my brother had an Uber driving the rest of the way to fucking Vermont. And I was like, holy fuck, he never did it before. It's not a habit. But I, yeah, literally was shit on by Luch. I still love the little guy, but definitely a first for that, man. Disgusting. Honestly, I, I said to my wife, that, that was the most disgusting thing that has ever happened to me. And I was in North Adams for four and a half years. So <laughs> so I feel Anyways, like your grind you know. my gears is more just like dog owners as opposed to dogs. Dog owners that put them put their dogs in bad positions. Great call. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's probably it. Although Bad etiquette. Luke, bad etiquette from dog Bad dog owners. etiquette. Yeah. Although Luke shitting on me was mine. It wasn't really Paul's fault, so I can't pin that one on him. But either way, I know people are going to bellyache about this because everyone loves dogs. I do too. Just don't want them fucking in my bananas. So once again, bigdealbrewing.com slash finder. Go find yourself some Big Deal Brewing. Everybody's enjoying it where it has been so far. It's still coming. still rolling it out. BigDealBrewing.com slash find it. Go get some. Not a lot of sports going on unless you're a baseball freak, but the World Cup just finished up. But I don't know. I feel like uh, Messi got more, more uh, play than the World Cup, the Women's World Cup, Merles. Well, uh, what's your take overseas, buddy? Yeah, you know, Sweden got third place, so we watched that game. That was exciting. Today's championship or Sunday's championship was uh, was uh, not very fun. one nothing. Spain win. But what Messi's doing is unbelievable. Did you see the ticket prices? I saw a thing. I think it was 460 bucks for one ticket for this game. And normally they go for 20 bucks. It is, it's like 2000% higher prices. I see it all over like my old Facebook and stuff. People are trying to go to any of his games. Like if it's in Philly, does anybody got Philly tickets? He has just taken over. He's the, he's the goat and it's, uh, it's fun to watch. He's too good for the MLS though. He, he's way too good. He looks like a man playing with boys in these games. He's just so much better than these guys. Nice. Yeah, they they yeah. flashed his stats. What, what did he have? Like like fourteen points or like something crazy in like the however few games he played. And actually, he did a cool gesture when they were giving him the trophy. He made sure to get the previous captain. He's like, no, no, you're carrying it with me, which I th- thought that was pretty cool. So this would stuff. be like like Sidney Crosby going and playing in like the ECHL. Like yeah. he would dominate like that. Like this, I feel like this yeah. is like he is just so much better than these guys. It's He's, crazy. It's he is un- crazy. unbelievable, man. Uh, also, um, two Merles. I think I put this in oh, 17 days ago. Um, Miami FC. They are into Miami FC, are they? I hope, right? Because <laughs> I know some cities have the FC. <laughs> they're inter Miami. Inter Miami. Because, yeah, when they signed him, I was like, oh, what are the odds? They were six to one when I got him. So. A couple bucks on that. I haven't had a Ooh, winner for a while. So that's that'll, nice. Ooh, that'll I pay like for that. tomorrow's. I've team. been doing good on the uh, Premier League. I've been putting a few picks out on Twitter. Premier League trying to get warmed up for the Euro hockey. 
I can't find lines for the Euro hockey preseason, but uh, if, if anybody out there can find them, let me know. Cause the, the overs are, I see a lot of overs. It feels like they're all just showing up playing some pond hockey in these exhibition games. You got a new member of EBI. My father asked for a great t-shirt, but we didn't have any chiclets ones in stock. So I hooked him up with a EBI. He's psyched to be on the Merle strain. Yes. Let's go. Let's go. Tell him to send me some winners. Give him my number. I need some, I need some extra winners. Absolutely. Well, we're going to go to another guy, speaking of winning. He won a Stanley Cup with the Kings a couple years back. Get bounced around a little bit. Now he's going to start the season with the New Jersey Devils. Great chat with Tyler Toffoli. So and R.A., before that. we go yeah. to the interview, yeah. I just do want to say this uh, interview was recorded before he was traded to the Devils. So I just want to clarify that for all the listeners. It was, it was recorded about a month and a half before he was traded to the Devils. Good call, G. Yep, good, po- good call pointing that out. So without further ado, enjoy Tyler Toffoli. All right, before we go any further, here's a word from our friends at Shady Rays. Take on the sun with gear built to last. Our friends over at Shady Rays have you covered for the warm weather ahead with premium polarized shades at an affordable price. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that offers a world-class product that's just as good as any expensive pair we've worn. Durable flames and extremely clear optics for all your outdoor adventures are there. I've had many pairs. I've talked about it before. I've got to get another one. Great, greatest sunglasses I ever had, man. The best bang for your buck. And the best part, you lose them, they get broken, a free replacement. That's it. Seriously. Shady Rays has the most insane protection in all of eyewear. Every pair of sunglasses is backed by their lost program replacement policy. It's great. And it doesn't stop at the quality either. Good stuff. Even on a day, one year, two years, whatever, you break them in two years, they're going to send you a brand new pair. Who offers that? Nobody. Together with their customers, Shady Rays is providing much-needed support to nonprofit partners across the U.S. through Shady Rays Impact. From building play sets for pediatric cancer patients to providing young adults with MS the outdoor adventure of a lifetime, Shady Rays is making an impact in your community and others like it now for years to come. Another great reason to get Shady Rays. If you don't love them, no big deal. Exchange it for a new pair or return them for free within 30 days. There's no risk when you shop with Shady Rays their team always has your back. Exclusively for our customers, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. Go to ShadyRays.com, use the code CHICKLETS for 50% off two or more pairs of Polaroid sunglasses. I'm telling you, folks, you've seen me wearing it for years. These things are legit. They're the best. Look at that price. And if you lose them or break them, boom, they replace them. Unreal deal. ShadyRays.com. CHICKLETS code. Check it out. Save some dough. All right, it's time to bring our guest on. After four years with the OHL's Ottawa 67s, this forward joined the LA Kings, who took him in the second round of the 2010 draft. He spent his first eight seasons in Southern California, where he won the Stanley Cup in 2014. After a brief pit stop in Vancouver, he signed up Montreal, where he helped lead the Habs on an unlikely cup run a couple years back, and he just finished his second year with the Calgary Flames. Pleasure to welcome to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Tyler Toffoli. How's the summer going, man? It's awesome. Just uh, just got back from Worlds and uh, a little vacay, so just kind of getting back to uh, back to the grind almost. Rubbing yeah, out with little Bradley that, uh, Cooper at Rolling Garros or what? What are you oh, doing no, over there? No, I didn't see him. No, we, we were uh, we were in the slums. We were just had the uh, we had the ground seat, so we couldn't get into the, uh, the big buildings there, and uh, so we couldn't watch the big matches. But we uh, we walked around and uh, grabbed some beers and uh, just cruised. Any other celebrity sightings uh, besides uh, maybe no Bradley Cooper, but anyone else you see? Uh, Mackenzie Weger, he was out there. <laughs> oh, okay. There uh, you go. Weeks, that's a, that's a yeah. famous person. Yeah, Weeks was there, and I guess he said uh, he he was there the day after me, and he saw uh, Quinn Hughes too. So I guess all the hockey boys kind of got the hint to uh, to go over there and check it out. Does Team Canada pay for that flight over there? Uh, they, I had to pay for my flight to Paris, and then from Paris. It uh, it was covered, so it was kind of you know set up set up real nice. I, what a, what a great experience! A team like I mean, I, I don't think many people know how unreal Riga Latvia is. I, I believe it ended up finishing off in in Finland. But how was the whole experience for you? Had you been before? How many worlds was this? And I mean, how special was it getting the gold? So that was my sec. That was my second world. The uh, the first time I went was in Prague. So I I. I was a little nervous. You picked the to, good cities. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, I was a little nervous to see if it was going to be able to uh, to match that. But so we started in uh, in Budapest for a little training camp, which is unbelievable. And uh, and then we went to Riga, and Riga was everybody was asking. I you know I said it's it's like a little Prague in a sense. It it was 
lights out. The food was unbelievable. The, uh, the, uh, the dinners, the nightlife was good too. And, um, it was just awesome. It was, like you said, a great experience and team Canada, they do it right. They, uh, they treat us really well. And, um, you know, after wins, we got beers in the locker room, pizza in the locker room. And, um, you know, we're walking out and it was funny. I was, I was just with, uh, Kopi, uh, yesterday and, uh, his brother was working with Slovenia and it was just, he was laughing because after some of the games, I'd be walking out with like two or three beers in my hand and he'd be looking at me like, <laughs> what the fuck's this guy doing over here? But, uh, no, it's fun. They, they make sure that, um, that we have a lot of fun and obviously we're there to win, but, uh, it was, it was incredible. If you had two or three in your hand, how many did Luch have? <laughs> oh, he, he, he has bigger hands. So, you know, he had, he had um, <laughs> all the pockets stuffed and, uh, we, you know, we're, we're a bus right away, but it was like, you know, five minutes and him and I are at the back of the bus. We're having like three tall Heineken before we even get back to the hotel. <laughs> we're like stumbling into the hotel. We're like, oh, oh baby, here we go. <laughs> oh yeah. Hey, the young people- guys on that team got a few cultural experiences. They got the, the different country and then getting to hang around Luch and expanding their liver. Oh, you know what? It was, it was awesome. It was, it was funny. It was like a completely different experience from when I went, uh, the first time it was, uh, 2015 when I went. So I think I was like 23, uh, 24. And I was the young guy kind of going out, out every night. And then coming here, I was, you know, Lutz and I were the old guys and, uh, we have had like, you know, Fantilli was there was 18 years old. And then we had, um, you know, Quinter and, uh, Crabsy, like all these guys that are younger. It was just kind of funny, you know, seeing the, the flip switch in, in a way. And, uh, the kids were great. They were a ton of fun. And, um, everybody had a great time. You had the C, right? Was that a question? First time. No, it, uh, it, it was a question for sure. It, uh, I've, I've never had, had the experience, you know, I've been like the assistant, but you know, in Ottawa and when it was like my fourth year and it was almost like, you know, there was nobody they else had to, to wear give the it a. to you then. <laughs> yeah. The, you know, there's nobody else to wear the A. I had like 57 goals the year before. They're like, oh God, we got to give this guy the assistant, you know, one of those. So, um, but it was, it was, it was, it was really cool. The, uh, the way they did it, you know, the coaches told myself and uh who was it weeks luch uh lawton and, and krauser in and said that i was gonna be the captain and and they were pumped for me and um you know it was it was it was very surreal that tournament it's it's funny because some guys you know they turn it down and you understand after a long year but for anyone who's ever been it is actually that fun and like the talk of the beers after it's just so much different than i guess the olympics when the nhl guys are there it's which, which that happens, but it's it's more laid back, but you're also getting to experience international hockey. So I feel like that's probably the best part about it is as, as serious as you're taking it and the games start, no doubt, like you're, you're there to win a gold, but you're having a lot of fun off the ice. So it makes it more enjoyable to be there with like your buddies. And you had Weeks and Luch, so it was like a, a crew that you were real familiar with, I'm sure. Yeah, I know. And, and I think... And- to go back to that, another great thing is being able to meet the new guys, you know, like, you know, being in the West most of my career, like I was in Montreal for a year and a half or whatever it was, but, um, you know, being able to meet the guys who play in the East that you don't know who are 21 years old. So it's like, you know, you, you just, you, you, you spread your friendship and, um, it, it also, it makes it easier for you, you know, say you get traded at some point, you, you know, say I get traded to Buffalo or, you know, somewhere like that. I, I know three guys on the team now, so it just, it makes everything, you know, the transition easier. And, um, you know, for the first half of the tournament, you have a roommate too. So it's like, you know, I miss that. I, mean, I think my first year in, in, when I was in LA, we had roommates and I was with Muzz, uh, Muzzin. And it was like, you know, it was awesome being able to, you know, fall asleep and you're chatting, you know, you're just saying stupid shit. And then it was kind of <laughs> the same, it was the same here. It was like, it was me and Krauser in Arizona. And it was like, you know, we're, we're coming home from, from, from the bar and stuff. We're just like laying in bed talking about the, the most ridiculous thing. And then we wake up in the, mo- in the morning. We're like, what, what were we thinking? Like, what were we even saying? Sort you of got thing. secondhand embarrassment. You're not even talking oh. to each other based on the conversation, the conversation the night before. <laughs> oh yeah. The anxiety kicks in. You're like, well, what did I say? You're like, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, that was yeah, pretty man, dumb. I, I was just kidding last night. I, I wasn't being serious. Like, yeah, sure about it. <laughs> you asked yeah, the coach for exactly. a new roommate. <laughs> um, I want, I wanted to ask you, 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 you touched on being a vet and also playing with these younger guys who you've never spent any time with. Like who are some of the younger guys there that impressed you the most? And, you know, from seeing the, the NHL evolve over your career, like how fascinating it is to see some of these young guys come in with like their skill set and how much stronger and more developed they are than maybe in years past. 
Yeah, I would say I'd say Quinter uh, in Buffalo for sure, just because he played in Ottawa for the '67. So I kind of knew a little bit about him. Uh, watched him a little bit when he was in junior, and then um, I think the, pat, the this was his first kind of full year in Buffalo. The year before, he was in the minors, and um, I think from the first practice, I was talking with Lawton, and, and I was like, "Oh shit! Like this guy is way better than I thought he was because I'd never played against him." Um, so he was he was definitely fun to watch. He did some some things on the ice. I was, you know, feels like not very many guys can can do. The, you know, he's so quick and fast, and uh, he scored some big goals for us. And then obviously Fantilli too. He, Eighteen years old, he's playing with. You know, you know how it is. Some of the guys in Europe, you know, on on uh, Latvia, they're thirty years old. You know, thirty four years old, just like older men. And he scored one of the nicest goals I've seen. You know, it was his first goal of the tournament. It was huge and. Um, he's gonna be fun to watch too. Yeah, we actually uh, we got to interview him since since the tournament ended, uh, and I, I was kind of blown away. Like, you know, you meet some younger guys, and you're around them a lot more than than Biz or I, but they're they're, they're quiet or more shy. It's just different. But he seems like a little more mature. Maybe it's the college aspect. I don't know, but totally seemed like a kid who's who's gonna be ready to jump into pro hockey, whether it's this year or the year after. I was pretty impressed just by kind of his not just his attitude, but his personality. Yeah, and just you know, he 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 fit right in. You know, the yeah. way he looked too. Like he did. He, he's not small. He's he's as, he's bigger than me. You know, he's he's as thick as me already. He's eighteen years old. Uh, but it's funny that the the first practice in Budapest, where all the boys are getting ready to go on the ice, and and we're like, "Where's fans?" Like you know, guys are trying to like meet each other, sort of thing, and shoot the shit. He's on. He's on the table. He's getting the rub down. A guy's course oh, that's not going well. They don't get it. There you no. go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, I think I don't know who it was. It might have been. It might have been Lot goes in and he goes, "Pants, you, you you good? Like everything okay? Do you you hurt yourself last night? Like joking around." And then of course Lottie comes to the room. He tells me right away. He goes, "Fucking Fancy is on the table. You got to go get him." So I I jump up. I'm like, so, I'm so pumped to go in there and say something. I'm like, "Hey, Fancy, Fancy, you good?" He goes. What top? Is everybody going to come in here and say something? I'm like, absolutely. Get <laughs> off the table. Like, jump on the foam roller. Because the same thing happened to me when I was younger in uh, in LA. I, I got on the table, and, and you guys you guys know Matt Green. Oh, yeah. So I'm on the table. And Greener is one of the funniest, most sar- sarcastic guys I know. And he just rips into me. And I was, I, it took me, honestly, eight years to get back on the table. Oh my god! He probably Biz pulled took his groin. The, uh, the table from Lemieux in camp his first <laughs> yeah. year. He probably pulled Mario his groin. Him. Probably pulled his groin being balls deep in one of those Latvian girls. So it's, that's all we've been <laughs> oh, talking man. about is uh, all these Latvian. Well, these young guys must have been walking around with boners the entire time. How hot <laughs> the girls are over there? No, well, I, they definitely are good looking. You know, it's funny the, the way everybody everybody dressed like to the tent too. So it's like it was like a Monday afternoon, and you know we're on the on the bus to the rink and guys are like what is going like what is happening it's it's monday afternoon like are people don't work here or like what they're where you know they're all decked out they got like like all the men are in like suit and tie they're just like cruising around the streets and i'm like this is not like back home this not isn't calgary where are the <laughs> cowboy boots exactly the boots and the hat Ty, you would not keep it tabs in the playoffs at all or you guys even care over there just kind of wrapped up what you guys are doing I think I, I I've been paying attention. Obviously, I have, I have friends on on all the teams, especially now with Vegas with uh, with Marty and Quickie too. So um, I think it's it's been fun to watch. And uh, I mean, the, I think the first round of the playoffs was some of the best hockey I've seen. And I don't even normally watch the playoffs, especially if I don't make it. But uh, I was watching the games, and I I couldn't turn it off. Yeah, um, good we stuff. actually talked about Vegas, and, and I don't know when this will drop, but. You know, everyone talks about Petrangelo and Theodore, and, and and they got a bunch of great D, but I feel like Martinez doesn't necessarily get enough credit, and, and, and you've seen firsthand what he does. Like, Can you explain like what he's like in the room? I mean, on the ice, he's just so solid blocking shots. What, what kind of guy is he? Oh, he's a great dude. He uh, he cares about everybody. You know, everybody gets along with them, and um, he's just one of those guys that you, you want him to be successful. You want him to do well, and... Um, nice. I think when he scored both those goals in, in 14 to beat Chicago and then uh, game what, five or six to beat the Rangers, it's like it couldn't ha- happen to like to a nicer guy. So it, it almost it, it works out really well. So um, definitely cheer for him. And uh, obviously Quickie has been playing, but um, cheer for Quickie too. He's he's the same. He's such a good guy. His family is awesome. So 
Uh, we'll see what happens. You mean you mean Johnny's a pizza? <laughs> he uh, he makes some pizzas. He's got his uh, he's got his uh, pizza maker in his backyard here. He's he said that he too. would get. He said he would get a ten out of ten pizza review from Prez if Prez went over there. <laughs> are his are his pizzas that good? They're solid. I mean, I'm sure he's. I'm sure he, we need a couple of Guinness to uh, to get us all, all, <laughs> all, you know, all warmed up. up and exactly, and that and that'll be good. But um, they're actually solid, and and uh, him, his wife is one of the best cooks too. Like we'd go over for for Thanksgiving, and it would just be one of the best spreads you've ever seen. So it's, uh, I believe it. I, I just want to quickly go back to the to the worlds. So, like, were you aware of everything that was going on with Latvia and the fact that, that it was the first time they ended up meddling in, in an international competition? And how crazy was it there while you guys were there as, at, to the build up to what ended up happening as far as the celebration? I want to say there was over a hundred thousand people in the streets at one point celebrating, and even to the point where they declared it a national holiday. Yeah, so it was kind of funny. We played them the first game of the tournament, and I think we won like six one or something like that, and. Uh, I mean, the fans were, they were loud, but it was like three, four, nothing after the first period. So they weren't like, you know, fully into it. And, um, they, they reeled off like three, four straight wins or whatever it was to, to get into the, the four seed or whatever it was. So then, uh, who'd they, who'd they beat? Sweden? I can't remember yeah, who it was. Yeah, they upset a, a big yeah. nation, either Finland or Sweden. Yeah. It would have been Sweden because we played, we played Finland. And when, when I saw that, I was like, what is what is going on? Because Sweden looked unbelievable over there. Like they have some stud. And once once we were playing them in the semis, I was like, I told the guys in the room, I'm like, this is not the same team that we played in the you know the first game of the tournament. Like we got to be ready for the. And I think they scored early in the first, and and all their fans traveled to Finland, so it was like it was louder in Finland than it was in Riga. It, it felt like at least, and I was the, all the guys would honestly agree. It was it felt like. That was like the one time that we were like actually nervous. I know we lost to the Swiss and we lost to Norway too, but it was like, it like mattered, but like not really. This was like the, like the oh shit moment. Like we got to figure this out. And that's when uh, Quitter scored a huge goal and uh, fans for the, the winner there. So it was, it was nuts. Yeah. Weren't you down in that game to them at one point? We, we were down one, nothing. We tied it up and then they scored like the shift after we tied it up. And I was like, yes. There's no, I'm like, there's the no hell's way happening? we're winning this game. Yeah. And then <laughs> Quitter scored from like below the goal line, like off the goalie's head, like banked it in, something ridiculous. And then uh, that was like the early on in the third and then it was tied and then uh, fans scored with like maybe 10 minutes left in the, in the third and we ended up winning. But it was, it was a crazy game. It, it, is part of the reason, reason what brought you there? I mean, of course, represent your country is important, but Obviously, the season with Calgary probably left a, a bitter taste in everybody's mouth. You personally had an incredible season. Did you just want to go there to kind of, you know, maybe end the season on a positive note, have some fun, and kind of remember why you enjoy playing the game it's from the beginning? Yeah, it was because a lot of the Calgary guys, uh, so Weeks, Weeks said yes right away. Like, right when they asked him, he said, yeah, because he wanted to go. Um, but, like, a lot of the, the, the head trainer, uh, Kent, was going um, – the PR guy, uh, Kelso, I don't know if you, know, you guys know Kelso, he was going, so he was like in my ear right away too. And it was just like, I was thinking about it. And then Army called me from St. Louis and he was just like, uh, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun and there's no better way to end your season, you know, winning your last game. And that's kind of how I looked at it and that's what I wanted to do. And um, obviously, like you said, it helped having like Weeks and Luch and um, Mizey, just guys like that that I knew, so I was going to feel comfortable anyway going into it. Um, and it was, it was so, it was honestly, it was so much fun. Awesome. Which, just started talking about Latvia a second ago. Does Germany feel like they've kind of taken that next step at the National League? Tyler, like, you know, they were kind of a middling team, but they seem like they've really improved the last couple of years. Yeah. And I mean, if you think about it, they, you know, they got the silver, they didn't have Leon or Stutzel. So it's like, you know, they have those two guys. And, I mean, I know it's different. I know you can say the same thing with like Canada or, you know, whatever. But at the same time, you know, those two guys weren't there and, and they were still playing really good hockey. They, they play the, the, the right way. They play like the, you know, the, the North American style. So they don't really give up much. And, you know, going into that game too, it was, you know, we knew that we were going to have to, you know, score early or, you know, get up early and, and don't let the fans get involved. Cause I mean, the European fans are, 
it's like a soccer game. And there's like drums going the whole time. People are chanting. We're on the power play. You know, pe- the people are whistling. I have the puck and I'm like, I'm looking around. I thought the, the ref blew the whistle. And I was like, like, what the hell's going on here? I had no clue. That was with a Latvian but, uh, women looking at you like a piece of meat. <laughs> yeah. like, look, look at, at this flow. guy's stick handling skills. <laughs> I'd love to pop out a few Tafolis. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, but Germany was, they uh, they had some really good players. That uh, Who is the, uh, that Paterka in Buffalo? He scored one of the nicer goals against us. He went down the wing, made a move and sniped. And I was like, you know, this kid's going to be good too. So... I know. How it's does that crazy? Teammate. Like Germany's n- never had a player like like Leon, and then they got Stutzel, and then they got Cider. I-, I would imagine in the next ten years, you're going to see even more of these Germans. I mean, it's pretty cool for the game of hockey, but especially for their country. Good point. Yeah. No. I don't, even I didn't even mention that Cider. He's he's, he's unbelievable. He he played like thirty at least thirty minutes. You know, and on the big ice too. Like can't be easy, and he's just like skating around like it's nobody's business you know, making plays. He made some of the, like, just like the little things that people don't really notice, you know, the yeah. people that don't really know hockey, he's, he's doing everything in, and just making it all look extremely easy. Uh, what about uh, Petrarca's teammate, Dev- Devin Levi? I didn't see much of the tourney. Did he get a lot of ice over there? And uh, this kid looks like the real deal already. What a positive guy he seems like. Always upbeat, oh, smile on his every face. Day. He's just a joy to be around. Every day. He was just like so happy. And uh, I think he played, he played one game played really well and just you know the way that uh Motsi was playing it was like they could not play it you know he was, he was arguably the best goalie in the tournament um but yeah every day he came in he worked he wanted to get better he was you you know staying on the ice um uh, we had days off and he was going to the rink and skating with the goalie coach so it was like he, he treated it you know like like you know like a little camp for himself almost and i think he's gonna be good he was he was definitely making some crazy saves in practice and he uh, I think he's going to be good too. Buffalo has some good players coming up. We don't need to go into detail, but after you guys won, who was the biggest puddle on the team? Who got the luch aside, but I think he can handle his beers better than most. <laughs> so who was the guy who was just waffled where maybe even his personality came out? You were like, oh my God. It, it, it kind of sucked is when after we won, it was, I think we, it was like an eight o'clock game and everybody, we had to drive to Helsinki at like 2 a.m. Oh. So by the time we got out of the rink, you know, obviously we're, we're chugging beers in the room and then, you know, we're trying to get out. Guys are, guys got drug tested after the game. So we were like kind of waiting for them. And then we had to leave them because they, they were, they couldn't, you know, take a leak after the game. So it was just like, it was kind of ridiculous that they're testing guys after the gold medal. Game, Half but. the guys tested positive for Viagra. <laughs> <laughs> but like, Luke's so just we just chokes getting, out the guy. <laughs> <laughs> we get back to the hotel, like, like midnight maybe so we have like two hours of, of drinking beers and uh drinking whatever the like the schlebo or whatever it was over there um and so nobody nobody was really like that in one to be honest no okay which is well, that's kind good. of upsetting that's good that everybody kept it on the rails and, and did a classy job of, of parting with the gold medal <laughs> i did i did notice though looking back at your hockey db it's pretty cool in in ottawa uh your first year there was kill ray his last year Right, I mean, yeah. he's a he's a famous coach. Like, what, like, what, what, did, what rubbed off of you from having Killer as a coach there, and, and what types of things did he t- teach you earlier in your in your junior career? It was he was he was great. He was great to me too. I I think it was just good to to have like the old school mentality, you know, right from the get go. He he was hard on guys. He was hard on the young guys for sure. Uh, but his practices were the same. It was the same practice, honestly, every single day. And I think it was like maybe 18 minutes long so it's 40 just like, years dude probably yeah no i, I honestly i Take think it was the same the practice. practice his entire oh i can't it was 15 years ago you know will go around two on ones in the world you know, dude he's three still on buckled. ones <laughs> <laughs> he, he, and he, he did the he, peanut to start yeah he had the puck he had the pucks in the middle i can't remember exactly what we were doing but basically he would just he would just like skate he would like pass it to pop and you're literally just going around in a circle basically and just going down and ripping shots on the goalie and i'm just like we do that for 10 minutes i was half the practice i'm like i was like what is can going we, on here? can we blow it down here he's he's on the he's <laughs> on the bench smoking a cigar sleeping taking uh, a little dirt nap I, think, I i can't remember what year it was but they they stopped letting him smoking uh smoking his cigars but i want to say he had he still had his uh he still had his molson x on the uh on the bus we stopped a couple times to, uh, for a pit stop for him that's awesome. I, I got a random question because you mentioned that year 
uh, when you had 57 goals in the O. I'm just kind of looking over your Not stats. Like, did you go back? Were you were you an overager the next year or or no? No. So so that was my third year. So I I had got drafted and I went to Kings Camp and I. I was I was not in good shape. Like, you know, I was one of those guys that you know really skilled, could, you know, score, do all those things. And I showed up to camp, and Dean Lombardi just absolutely well, roasted me. Like, no. it was one of the most. I he, he didn't even let me finish. I don't even know if I made any of the camp. Like, he didn't even let me skate with the guys. Wow, he's like, that was, pissed off. I was I was the second rounder, and I was in like the you know group C or whatever, like the the entire camp, and I didn't even practice with the big boys basically. And I remember that summer, I think I stayed in LA and worked out with like, you know, Greener, Stoley, uh, Carts, the, the, all the older guys, all the guys that, you know, take care of themselves and, and whatever. And I went back and just, it was, a, it was like easy for me. I had 57 and maybe 108 points or 106 points or something like that. And, and then, so that was my third year. And then my fourth year, I think I had like 52, uh, maybe a hundred points that year. So. Yeah, yeah, you did. But I, so you couldn't have played in the AHL that year anyway, though. No, I, I want to. I went and played AHL games after my third year. I think I played. You know how you can go after the season, yeah. you sign or whatever. And I played a couple there, but um, I think we we ended up losing to to Binghamton in the playoffs, and that's the year that they won. They they had all those guys come back from from Ottawa and and ended up playing games, and they spoke to everybody. Were you just not trading hard enough in the off season? Like, what was going on? Like, what was your what was your fat test when you when you got there with the cal- the scalpers oh. there? Fat twenty like percent. <laughs> like, no, what right? popped percent. up is it just says fat I wouldn't say twenty percent, but it was like it was <laughs> it was one of those where I want to say they put it like they put everybody's thing on the board. And I was like for sure towards the bottom. Like I was just like, and I, but I wasn't fat like in that. I was just I was like skinny fat, like no muscle to my body. It was just like it wasn't pretty. Had you not been working that hard with an off-season trainer? Because from what I read, your father's your father's a scout, right? Or at least was at the time. He is. He is now. No, he. So he worked uh, like minor hockey for for uh, the Junior Canadians with me. But like, I mean, I worked out, but I I was just there, you know, having a good time, shooting the shit with the, all the guys, and, <laughs> and you just I, love the you know, game. Like, you love the room. hour. <laughs> yeah, like I'd go in, like you know, twice a week, or you know, whatever it was. Like I'd skip days. <laughs> I'd skip days, and then I would just like go and skate and you know score goals and you know, i was just like one of those i was fortunate right and then you know once once i met dean that was a it was a completely different it was a wake-up call that's the biggest thing about stepping into pro it's like as natural as you are nah man you got to hit the gym because all these guys are, are just to. as skilled just as fast just as this so now all of a sudden it's diet this coach that coach the whole kit and caboodle all right Every, everything <laughs> yeah what, what's cool what's a cool part of that for me like talking to you though is I mean, that's a long time ago, but here it is this year, you're 31 and you just had the best year of your career. So it's like, obviously things have changed where you've become kind of an animal training, I'm assuming, knowing like, I want to stay in this league till I'm 35, 37 years old, like things got to change and they have, right? Yeah. And I mean, I'm talking to my agent too, the past couple of years, he was like, oh, you got to start, you know, doing all like the little things, like going for uh, massages and, you know, all the all the all those like little things that I never I never did before, or even like like warming up and doing like the workouts before uh, practices and all that stuff and and working out after games. I never really did that until the past couple of years. And um, I think for me, working out after games was so huge for me because it I I felt strong the entire year and it it really wasn't it's not hard. It's like two sets of um, you know lunges or trap bar and some core and then you're, you're done and it's just like the little things of uh keeping everything like even as much as you can throughout the year because you guys know it's such a grind so um that that went a long way for me first how annoying does it get like that like retiring i was so relieved that i didn't have to spend an hour activating every goddamn muscle in my body just so i could be warm enough to go out there and go because back in the day most people just jump on the bike for 10 15 minutes but now it's all these band works to get your glute Right from your toes up to your up to your noggin, you got to get it going before you go out there. Yeah, and then you, like I said, you guys know how you know, throughout the year you get like little negative injuries or whatever oh. it is. And I kind of like tweaked my groin a little bit, so I was, you know, I had I was seeing the trainer. Um, it got to the point where I'm like, I'm just gonna like tough this thing out. If it gets worse, then it's gonna get worse. But I can't, I can't be doing you know all this band stuff for 20 minutes right now, like every single morning at 
eight thirty in the morning when all you want to do is have a coffee and and do you a know, crossword, watch, like, coffee, a yeah, shoot, right. crossword, <laughs> yeah. Watch, watch the, watch the highlights and, and hang out with the guys. You know, it's, it's funny how that works. So, oh, I uh, miss cool. cock talk for sure. Oh, I miss the room. <laughs> That's why we have this podcast. It's our mini room. But uh, <laughs> going back to just, just you know, earlier the, the 67s days, you were a second round pick. I mean, it was a, there's some solid players in the first round, but I think looking back, you'd, you'd be a way, way higher pick. Were, were you looking maybe to go first round? Like, what were the expectations going into the draft when you were 18? I think I was supposed to go, like, you know, from 15 to 30. And, and it was, I, my, I, my combine sucked. So I'm oh. sure everyone was like, oh, this guy probably doesn't care, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it, it, that was that was a wake-up call for me too because, you know, I saw some of the guys get drafted and like, no offense, you know, to some of them. But like, at, yeah. the, at the time, I'm like, I know, I know I'm better than, yep. more than half of these guys. And so it was just like, all right, people didn't, don't think I'm good enough. So I, I got to work and uh, I got to prove them wrong. And if, if I can't prove them wrong, then obviously they were right and they made the right decision. So... It's uh, it's kind of stuck with me, honestly, my whole career, and it's 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 kind of you know funny to 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 see how that works. And I want to say that that that's kind of why sometimes if you see a lot of the the guys in the second round end up having you know crazy careers because you know they have that chip on their shoulder and um they want to prove people wrong. Do you did you go that night? Were you there sitting through the whole first round? Oh, I was there, and it was oh, oh I was sitting there. Oh. And I was like. I was like, there's no way. I'm like, there's no, it got to like pick 25. I can't remember what it was. And I think Arizona had like two picks right at the end of the first. And I'm like, I had a, I thought I had a good interview with, uh, I'm like, I'm for sure getting picked with one of these guys. Like one of these, I think they had like 29 and 27, something like that. Yeah, we I'm fucked like, I'm it for up. sure going to Arizona. And, Shock, are they and screwed they, it up? <laughs> and they passed on me. I was like, what the fuck is going on? I had, I was, I was, I was mad. I was embarrassed too, and it was just it was tough. And that was was that when it was only one round in, in the first day, or did no, you have to sit yeah. through the rest? Okay, no, because yeah, no, it was one it was one round, and then you you go back to the hotel, and you're they're like, oh yeah, like let's have dinner and you know go to sleep. We'll come back tomorrow. I was like, what? I'm like, I don't want to do anything. I don't want to go for dinner and <laughs> sit with my parents. Dude, you know, we thought we were going to the first round. You know, so um, thank God I. I, w- I honestly, I wish it was all in one day and just got it over with. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're seventh. You got the seventh most most points in that draft now. So things things have gone pretty good. <laughs> but a few weeks before LA took you, you actually got drafted by a, a KHL team, like totally out of the blue. You didn't talk to anybody over there. They just picked you willy nilly, huh? I think I think they picked a couple guys too, and yeah, the like guys that I knew. And we talked about it. We're like, we're like, what does this what does this really mean? Does this mean like we like we got to go over there and like play some game? I can't remember. I can't remember who who picked me, but I asked one of the one of the Russians who I ended up playing with, and they're like, "Oh, that's not a good city. You don't want to. You don't want to go there." <laughs> yeah, After yeah. Dean Lombardi uh, ripped you a new asshole and was blowing cigarette smoke in your face, were you considering going uh, to the Super League or what? Oh, oh, I thought I was going to have to. I was like, "There's no way I'm playing for this guy," <laughs> let alone making the team and then having to play for Daryl. I'm like, "There's no oh. shot here." Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> so, should we yeah, get well, to the Daryl talk or what? <laughs> You, I, I mean, I you love it up. It, no, I I love Daryl. It's it's funny. I mean, you, you you guys have heard all the stories, you know. Like, there's stories for days, but it's just the the way that he he treats guys. He he rubs some guys the wrong way. But if you if you for me personally, because I had him when I was you know 20 years old, so I was like I was wrapped under his spell from day one. I was like, if you don't play well, then you don't you don't play. If if you don't work, then you don't play. If, if you don't get the puck out on the wall, you don't play. So it's just like that's. That was like my whole thing. I'm like, I better do everything right or I'm going to play three minutes tonight you know, sort of thing. And I for sure had games where I think I honestly played maybe three shifts in a, in a game. And I, no didn't, and I wasn't even playing bad. Wasn't even playing bad. And I would play three shifts. And so it was just like for me and, and going back to play for Daryl, you know, the, for the second time, I, I loved it because I, I, had he- I had heard all of the stuff that he was saying, like all the things in the, in the you know, the, the video sessions and all that. So I, I knew all of it, so it was like, and I'll, obviously I was one of his one of his guys too. So it, that obviously helped, but he still kind of went after me every once in a while, which kind of got me going. Go, going back to the beginning, let's say a game you would have three shifts. Would there be communication between the two of you, or would you have to just sit there in your thoughts and 
And if so, like, did you have any of the older guys to lean on as to be like, hey, like, what the fuck did I do wrong? And they'd be like, really, man, it's, it's nothing. That's just kind of the way she is. I think, I mean, there's a couple. I think one time I was, I was actually playing really, like pretty well and I'd show up to the rink and you know, you know how like guys are like the gold line, the blue line, you know, the green line or whatever. And I was the only guy wearing like my own color. <laughs> and I was like, I was looking around. I'm like, I'm like, what is going on? And like I said, I wasn't playing bad. I was, you know, I had like you know, four points in the last 10 games and I was, I was on the fourth line, like not, no power play or anything, like whatever. And Brad Richardson came up to me and he goes, hey, fella, don't worry about it. You know, you'll be back in the lineup next game. I promise you. I was like, there's no way. Like, I'm clearly on the odd man out. I'm literally wearing my own jersey right now. And could you not? The next day I'm, I'm back on a line with like carts and someone and I'm like I'm like what is going on and there's Mind like no torpedoes. communication oh there's no communication from Daryl but I thought you know looking back at it I think it's hilarious and like being able to tell these stories I think it's awesome so it's like I mean he's he helped my career but I mean Dude, everybody everybody's different right I, I love the millionaires bro when he oh would, yeah oh <laughs> that's some of the funniest the shit I've ever heard <laughs> the best I can't remember who was it was like Kopi. Brownie, Justin Williams, Cards, but then I think like I want to say like Gabber, uh, Dwight King, Dwight King was yo know, Gabby was on it too, but like Dwight King was like tucked in the corner of it too. <laughs> it was just like the funniest thing. Because Kinger is like the nicest guy, super quiet and and, and everything, but they all would come in and just roast millionaires, bro. And and me and Trevor Lewis to be we're like we're on the other side. In the other quarter, we'd be, just be giggling, try, try to hide too, because we don't want to get chirp either. So it was, it was awesome though. What were the chirps he would be like saying under his breath? Like, would he always have some, some like famous lines that he would always recycle and go back to? Was it, a lot be, of times uh, he was just mumbling. Oh, so we, uh, so in Calgary, we don't have a practice rink, right? So we'd have to go to, uh, uh, Winsport where, uh, Canada, uh, Hockey Canada has all their, and it, it was like probably 20, 30 minutes outside the city. And whenever there'd be something going on at the Saddle Dome, we would have to go there. But majority of the time, we just would have like a day off. But if we have like a, we, we'd have a bad game or like a bad first period, during the game, he'd be like walking back and forth, mumbling, I guess we have to go to Winsport tomorrow. <laughs> you guys want to go practice at Winsport? <laughs> guys are, it's literally first period. It's like <laughs> zero, zero. We have like 15 shots and they have three. And he's like, just chirping the guys on the bench. Guess we have to go to Winsport tomorrow. The anthem, the anthem you know, finishes. Me. Oh, guess we got to go oh. to the practice facility tomorrow. <laughs> oh yeah, right or like warm ups. It'd be like zero zero, and and he'd come in and he'd tell our the uh, Vladdy Ladar to get ready to go in, and we're like we're looking at zero zero, and he's like, oh, Marky's not ready to play tonight. We're looking, we're like Marky, he's like, there's a reason it's zero zero. He's like, yeah, he has ten saves. <laughs> We haven't like tested the puck this whole period, and it's just like little things like that. It was it like you said, it's all my games. He's just trying to get guys going, um, you know. And it, I guess it happened in LA too. It kind of just um, you know started to wear on guys, and uh, you know the change change happened. The the one time that um, you know I don't know Daryl. I never played for him. I was hard on him on our show this year when. When that kid played his first game and he was kind of asked about it and he didn't know his name or pretended not to know his name. And there were kind of rumblings that guys in the room were a little pissed off about that. Was that true or, or maybe a little a little uh, fictitious? I think that was blown out of proportion. I, I don't okay. think guys were like mad. I think guys were maybe more upset because they didn't, they weren't telling him if he was going to be in the lineup to start. So it was like they wanted to get his parents in town, like all, the, all that, which I understand. But going back to me, I got called up when I didn't play for two weeks. When I got called up, I flew my dad out. My dad stayed with me for like a week and a half. And <laughs> I didn't one play. Game? I was literally just Cro not one at, game. At the La Quinta and on then the I coach. Got, <laughs> and I got sent down. And then I got sent down. And then I got called back up and I, I told my dad, I'm like, I'm not I'm not flying out. I don't know if I'm playing or, or not. And then so my, he wasn't at my first game. No oh, way. Hey. Yeah. It, to, but, but it's just it's funny, it's funny how um just because there was so much shit going on in Calgary too, so it just everything. It felt like every little thing was getting blown up. But it was funny because the whole time I was kind of laughing. I'm like, "Well, at least he just got called up and he might be playing it." I, it took me yeah. two and a half weeks to play. Th that's <laughs> the, like, I've that's been the, there, bud. Yeah. I've been there. <laughs> yeah, that that's the old school stuff that he didn't adapt to. Like he doesn't give a shit that you're playing your first game. 
He just no. is worried about the win, the lineup. But it, to the point where, or from my understanding, is if you had a kid during the season, he was not happy. Like he he wanted uh, he wanted guys dumping loads at a, at a perfect time to where this was all <laughs> happening in the off season and not being a distraction. And if you did have a kid, you better not be missing a game. Yeah, no, I think you're uh, being the placenta th- for pregame, fucking getting ready to go. <laughs> it was the uh, it was the year before me or the COVID year that uh, uh, Backlund had a kid. And, um, I guess the, he was up all night and the baby was born at like four a.m. or something like that, and he called. The, our trainer was like, hey, baby's born. Like, I'll see you guys like tomorrow. As in, like, he was just going to, you know, take the day and rest or whatever. And our trainer, he said he had to call him and be like, hey, uh, Daryl wants you here at the rink. Uh, you got to skate. He, so he said he, he showed up. He slept for like an hour and went to the rink, skated or whatever it was. And it was just like, I mean, it's a little, it's a little, he had his like own, that, that own jersey in his stall on his own line, too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Shit brown. But, it was shit brown it color. Makes, it makes me laugh. And all that stuff makes me laugh because it's like you, you don't you don't see that. So it's just it, I don't know. It 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 was hilarious to me. So no, I, and some guys take it that way. Other guys don't. Is it true at the point at, whether I don't know if it was the first or second cup run in L.A. that it was like a full on team mutiny where like you guys would have your own meetings and he was not involved in the meetings. That that would have been. I think that was a year after. Okay. When we it was a year after we won and. Um, or, or yeah, I don't know if it was 2015 or 2016, when but Chicago that's when that was the story when Justin Williams, we locked him out of the, the locker room <laughs> in Tampa. Yes. And so like, <laughs> as you guys know that you, there's like two ways to get in and yeah. like, and, and stick, but put garbage cans in front of both of them. And I think we won <laughs> the game and, and we were like, well, we don't want, uh, Willie was like, we don't want this guy in the locker room. So we're like, we start blasting the music and you can see the door like shaking, trying to get in and <laughs> get in. And it's just like- Two can that's, play that's this game, had, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. That's when we had an older team too. So it was just like, oh. like with, with Willie and Stoley and Greener, Karts, Kopey, Dewey, like all these, all these great guys, like obviously on the ice, but like off the ice, even better. So we're like blaring the music and you see the door shaking and guys are, we're dying laughing. We're singing. And then we jump on the bus and it's just- all quiet and then you just hear guys in the back of the back of the bus like open a beer and you can just see you can see daryl fuming at the st- at the front of the bus <laughs> what uh so so he would get angry or do you think in some cases he would love the fact that the team was uniting to go against him but that meant you guys were bonding and that's all he needed to see and winning and winning of course i think that's i think that's what he i think that's what he wanted he wanted guys to come together like he loved he loved it if if like you know like rookie party he loved the guys, you know, when we ha- we have a rookie party and ma- everybody's going, everybody's there having a good time. And like he expected it, he's expecting everybody to show up and be on. Well, we'd skate the next day, but you know, he's expecting everybody to show up and, and work and sweat it out. And, uh, and then after that, he, after practice, he'd be like, so how was it? Like, <laughs> like, what'd you guys, do? how was dinner? Like stuff like that. So is he, he definitely wanted to bring everybody together and everybody closer. Is there is there one story in particular it's particular about him that you like love telling that's okay to tell where you're not g- divulging too much information from inside the vault of the locker room? Like, is there anything? Because I I know that away from the rink he's a, he's a, he's a very lovable, enjoyable guy. It just seems like when he gets to the rink, he's a different person. Oh, he's yeah, he's completely different. I mean, there's nothing in particular. I mean, with me, uh, there was one day at practice he just roasted me the entire the entire morning. He I think he asked me. They, I was up and down and I was, uh, they announced that I was, uh, AHL rookie of the year. And so I was in LA at the time. And so I, guys are like happy for me, like cheer for me, whatever, like, like thank you, grads. And then I, sh- and then Daryl was like, he pulls me aside. He goes, so do you think you want to be, uh, an NHL player, like a, like a good one or, uh, an AHL all-star your whole career? And I was like, wow, it's, that's not, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting like, you know, congrats maybe. And then, so he's just like, kind of shit on me the whole morning and then you know i leave the rink and i'm i'm out, I'm out for a walk and uh with my my wife and she she sees daryl or she sees chris his son and i'm like oh god that means daryl's around like let's get off the strand here like i don't want to see this guy and he sure enough he's right behind and he ends up walking right into us and he, my cat she she's like oh hey daryl like, how are you he gives her like a big hug, a kiss on the cheek, and I'm standing there. I'm like, "What is this? This is awkward. Like, I I don't want to be here." He's like, "Hey, Ty, how was your morning? How, how was everything?" I'm like, 
what do you mean? Who the you literally fuck just is shit this guy? For four you hours. just ruined my morning. <laughs> you know, four hours. Like I'm, I'm walking on the beach right now because I'm stressed and I don't know what's going on. Jesus Christ! You, you yeah, you get back the next day. Your 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 uh, AHL player of the year trophies in the garbage next to your stall. You're like, what the <laughs> fuck is going on with this yeah. guy? The mind yeah. games. The mind games. Going back to that 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 cup year. I mean, you had been up the year before. You played ten games, but then your first full season in the NHL, you win the Stanley Cup. Did you have any idea? I know they had already won one two years prior, but did you did you understand like how good that team was when you got there? Did you know we like we can win the cup again? No doubt. So I think I started the year in the minors that year because, I mean, I I, I showed up and I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I played games, I played playoff games. I'm like, I'm on the team for sure. Yeah. And then I show up and I didn't have the best camp. I wasn't I wasn't very good. And so I started the year in the minors and I was like, well, this is this is annoying. Like you know, this is not. You know, this wasn't in the plan sort of thing. And I ended up having like 15 goals in 18 games or something when I was down there. And I was yeah. like, I got to get called up here soon. And then I ended up getting called up. And um, I was, I think I was, my first couple games, I was playing with Karts and, and, and R- Mike Richard. And I was like, oh, this is pretty cool now. Like, this is way better than playing in, in Manchester, you know? Uh, and we were kind of like, we were, I think we finished in like sixth place that year, but like, we played like the King style. We were winning games like 2-1, 3-2. Like, I don't think we ever blew anybody out. It was just, there was always a close game and quickly always playing uh, like lights out. And then once we got in the playoff, it was just like the whole mood kind of switched and, and everyone was like, all right, like this is all business now. We, we got to, you know, get to work. And we ended up going down 3 nothing to San Jose. I'm like, well, this is what, this isn't ideal. And we ended up coming, coming back and winning and, it was almost one of those things where after that happened, there was, I felt like there was no way we weren't going to win. Yeah, but it was. It was. It obviously wasn't easy. We we went to Game Seven against Anaheim and and Chicago, and um, and then obviously beating beating New York in the final. But it was that that team. If you look back now, you you'd be like, "There's no way that you know these guys didn't win." Do you remember like after losing Game Three to San Jose? Like, did the guys have dr- like drinks go up? Like at that point, it's kind of like, "All right, what are we going to do here?" Do you remember what the what the message was or who spoke or, or kind of what happened leading into game four. So the first two games were in San Jose and, and they mapped us. It was like 6-2, 7-1 or something like that. And game three was in LA. We, we lost in overtime and, and I think it was, I think it was uh, Marlowe scored like a weird one. It like hit off someone and like bounced over Quickie's head and, and went in. And we got back to the room. We're like, this is, this is better. Like we were, we were, you know, we lost, but we were, we were happy with, like we should have won in a sense and game four we we came out and we we won and and it was just we we took it every you know game by game and yeah it was one of those things where once we won i think we we won game five in san jose we're like all right well now we know we can win in san jose so you know let's let's you know come back and we ended up you know taking the game seven and once we got the game seven we're like there's no way we're losing like this, this theory is dark. Did you guys talk about like the history in the room? Like only like at the time, only three te- teams I think had come back. Did you even mention that? Or did you just kind of focus on on the task at hand? Uh, n- we never really mentioned it. I think, but I think Carson and Rick were on on that team. Yeah, Philly, yeah. That, that yeah, came sure back, were. right? <laughs> so I want to say they might have they might have talked about it a little bit, but it wasn't like we weren't comparing ourselves to anybody else. We're like we we know what we have to do. We got to get stuff done. And, um. Like the f- the first three games, we were just a wash, and we're like, all right, now we, we got to win four straight. So they were down three nothing in game seven too, after being down three nothing in the series. Crazy, yeah, yeah. And you, you got a huge assist, uh, Martinez. Is this double overtime cup winner in game five. Were you were you looking for on a business uh, pad to pass off the pads wow. there? Was that, was that you your got, intention? You went oh. the you want pop? No, <laughs> no. I was I was going I was going shelf, and it got deflected. <laughs> <laughs> it got deflected. I went right right to Marty, and that was. Honestly, that seeing that go in, I think I think Zuccarello came in and it was like a three on two with him back checking, and he I shot it and he absolutely buried me. For, uh, I shot it from like the top of the circle, and I ended up in the corner, and I I had like the perfect view of Marty putting it in. I was just it was one of the craziest experiences, and just seeing like uh, you know a guy like Mary Gabrick never winning and, and finally winning, and Robin Regeer, same like same thing, like older guys that have never won and. And I'm, you know, sitting here, it's like my first full year and I'm just like this spoiled little kid, you know, being able to win the Stanley Cup and uh, definitely kind of took it for granted in a sense because 
um, I didn't get back until, you know, for eight years, not even close. They lose in the first round sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, no, that experience is nuts. Were you guys partying after every round? Cause, cause I, I, from my understanding during that first cup run, they got the eighth seed and they were totally, it was totally unexpected that they were going to go on this tear. I think they beat Vancouver in the first round who won the president's trophy that year. Yeah. And they were just playing with house's money. So apparently with the time off, they were really enjoying themselves where they would go on like two, three day benders. Did they take that same approach in that run? No. Oh, I, so I heard that they were, they were going out at, and they were going on like going golfing and just like playing Bottle two rounds service. a day. And I'm just, <laughs> and I'm like, and I was at the, the when we were winning and we went, seven games every every round and we we're on the road for game seven so we were like we were packed up and just like going from city to city it honestly it felt like we didn't have a break until after beating chicago we had maybe like three days and but we we're still doing like all the media and stuff so it wasn't like we even had any time off right so once those we, were once three it was game seven over, wins on the road on the well, road, I think it's. I think we're the only team to do to to do that's it. fucking awesome. Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah. and, and then you get to win it at home, easy, right? So it's like perfect. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you guys know how the Shark Tank was back in the day. You oh. couldn't hear yourself talk or think or or anything. And then um, Anaheim was really cool because yeah, it was it was really loud, but a lot of Kings fans would would, would make the trick. So it was kind of like the fans almost going back back and forth, and they're you know they're cheering for both teams. So that was just as loud as. At Staples Center in the stand, and then and you guys know Chicago, Chicago, yeah. best, the most insane building. Uh, is there a reason that you wear number seventy three? It's almost like a training camp number you're given. And, and it is. Is it that you you kept it forever? Yeah. yeah. So it, I got it. It was my training camp number, and I, I never really cared about my number, but um, I got called up, and then we ended up winning, and then we the next the next year. It, I didn't like nobody even asked me if I wanted to change my number. I'm like, that's kind of weird. Like, I I gotta make the team. Like, I'm on the team. Like, 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 like I'm all, like, there's no way. And I was just, I was thinking the whole time. And then Dean came up to me. He was like, yeah, there's no fucking way you're changing your number. Like, that's bad luck. You know, you can't change your number after winning. Like, like, what are you thinking? And I'm like, oh, that actually, that's a good point. And then I just kind of stuck with it because I think it's pretty cool. It's unique. And, um, you know, the, there are very many, very many guys who wear 73 and, um, so it's, it, it's kind of funny. Well, you ended up having the seventies line so that it ended up working out perfectly. Right. So you guys got like a coin well, name for your line. It was you carts and who, sorry. Pierce. And oh, Pierce, Pierce. It, that's a train. That was a training camp number two. So it's kind of fun. It's funny how, how it worked out, but it, it, that was, that was really cool. The, you know, the seventies line and obviously people making a, a big deal and, uh, we were just kind of hanging on the carts as coattails there. He was he was playing lights out in the playoff. I, I want to ask you, I mean, this year was your career high in points, correct? Yeah. Thir- thir- 34 goals. And, you know, you had a great start with LA and there were a couple of years there where your play dipped. Like what, like, or at least from a point perspective, like did you lose your game a little bit? What happened? And, and how were you able to like get back to playing the way that you're able to play? Like, I think, I mean, you guys know how it is. I guess the, as the season goes on, it gets harder. It get you know, it gets and more intense and and obviously being like a younger guy too you you you, you do get a little tired so uh, i think for me i just kind of i would lose confidence a little bit and then um being a younger guy I'd, I'd lose i wouldn't play as much so i'd be losing ice time and and then i'd be frustrated with that and now it, i think that's what kind of changed is even if i didn't play as much i knew that i'd still get my my one or two grade a scoring chances and i have to score i have to you know be able to finish or or create something. And, um, I think that's kind of the biggest thing, even, you know, when I went to Montreal, I, I had that crazy year at 28 goals and 54 games or whatever it was. And it was just a matter of, you know, being able to capitalize on, on your chances and, uh, not getting frustrated because that, that's really what, what it comes down to is, is what I think is if you lose as a skill guy, if you lose your confidence, then, you know, that, that, that's everything for you. So, we had the Daryl conversation, but with this year, I mean, I know you guys made some major moves, but you guys got a great team on paper. Are you guys expecting a major turnaround next year? Was this just a an off year where everything went wrong? Like, what what are your expectations for this season coming up, and and what can change in order to make it better? Yeah, I mean, like you said, everybody had us. I think winning the West. You know, I did. Start you guys made me goes. look like a fucking idiot. Thanks. Well, you, we, you know, it's, it, we had the curse. You can't, you can't bet you on us. You got my fucking you... head shaved on national television, Toff. 
every every time every time you bet on someone, that team always loses. You're like they Drake lose. He's a <laughs> mom, little. You're Drake. You're calling me Drake? <laughs> like every he actually likes time. that. Six 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 yeah. six six hey. six. <laughs> and it's not. A, it wasn't a compliment. But every time you like every time you bet on so you're like oh like, these guys are a wag and they lose like ten straight games or something. Yeah, I'm like I'm a mush. This kid, I'm like this guy. This guy is nuts. But I think I think we're gonna turn around. I mean, like you said, we we have the guys, and I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know. Obviously, we have all these guys that have a year left, and um, I don't know if they're gonna trade some of us or or sign guys, whatever whatever's gonna happen. But um, it's gonna be interesting. But if if I'm there, then um, I'm expecting us to to be a completely different team. Well, based on what you're saying about M- Marky almost getting the hook after making 12 saves in the first period, not giving up a goal, I think that he'll bounce back and have a monster year. I, I got the chance to play with him in Florida and San Antonio, one of my favorite guys. But I, I wanted to ask you, like, I love the Saddle Dome. It's 100% time for a new building, and, it- and it's great news that they're going to get one. But you must have been laughing when Weeks did his postseason press conference, and he's like, yeah, we need a new rink. <laughs> oh, well, and, I mean, I don't want to like, you know, throw weeks out of the bus, but you know how it is like doing those interviews and the media, you, you're still kind of in one from the night before. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. You, 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 I saw weeks in the morning. And I'm like, oh, you, you know, he's, he's got to be hurting a little bit. And then he, he does that. And I'm, and I, I think I was like next or, or like two after him to do my, my media. And he came in and he goes, I can't believe I just fucking said that. I'm like, oh, what'd you say? He goes, well, I told him we need a new fucking ring. And I'm like, oh baby, here we go. So when I was walking to do my media, um, I can't remember if it was, if it was Kelsey or something. They're like, yeah, we just said we needed a ring. So you might get like a couple questions on that. I'm like, all right, well, if they ask me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say yes. Cause I mean, it is true. I mean, you guys, yeah. you guys have been at the dome. It's, it's time. And it's, it's funny. Just, I mean, like our locker room, you know, it's, it's not like, it's not NHL standard. Daryl probably like loved the it. Did Daryl love oh, the yeah. locker room? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, probably, but like the family room for the wives is, it's not, you know, it's, it's tough, but I mean, once they get this new rink built, I'm sure I won't be in the league. It'll take 10 years or whatever it takes to build a rink, but, um, it'll be good. And, and I think the city needs that. I think it's, it would be awesome for the city. I, I want to ask too, when you uh, sign with Montreal, what was the, like the ultimate thing that you, like, that led you to Montreal was like the deciding factor that you ended up there. Well, it was, it was kind of tough. That was the COVID year. It was like the worst oh, yeah. time ever for yeah. a free agent. Dying. and I, I had a I had uh like two three teams like serious you know whatever seriously talking to and um we kind of just decided that we wanted to give Montreal a shot and uh my wife wanted to go there and I was it was just one of those things where it happened it um you know I, I thought I was going to be there for four years and after that first season there I was like oh you know this is gonna be awesome you know I'm going to be here we're going to be good and then uh Webby you know got hurt and had to shut it down and, and price her too and you know it was just like the the worst things that could have happened and then i was just one of those guys and i had i had the trade value and and they they made the decision to move me so uh but we 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 enjoyed our time in montreal the city is awesome um it's it was just it was nice walking around and like i said my wife loved it she walked everywhere every day through old old montreal and and griffin town and all that so well, you got to play in some pretty good Canadian markets. I mean, you, you had a cup of coffee in Vancouver. I think a lot of people were surprised that you didn't end up re-signing there. Like, what was what was your experience there, and 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 you know, why why did that not go down? Yeah, it was it was weird. I I loved it. I like, talking to the guys. They you know, I was like, I'm for sure gonna come back here. I was waiting. I, I was trying to sign, you know, right away. Like when when I got traded, and they're just like, oh, we wanted to see how it all worked out. And I was like, okay, like I, you know, I get it or whatever. And then COVID hit, shut us down. And I was still the, the whole time. I'm like, all right, well, they're going to come back to me at some point. And I, I don't think unless I can't imagine my agent's going to be lying to me, but I don't think that they called ever. So it was definitely kind of like a frustrating experience because I loved it. And, uh, the city is amazing. We, we had a really good team, uh, and they ended up just going in a different direction. They, I mean, they didn't. They didn't sign me, Marky, or uh, Tanev, or or Stet. You know, four guys that were you know were liked in the locker room, and um, you know, I think I think it was frustrating for you know some of the guys that are still there, or, you know, or whatever. But and all um, four, you ended up in Calgary. 
Yeah. Because yeah. Stetch ended the, up there the, at the, the Cowboys, deadline the, this year. Holy the, shit, uh, just picking up the, their, uh, their sloppy seconds, eh? <laughs> yeah, the, the Calgary cannot. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, uh, I also read that you're a big Adam Sandler guy. So you just crush at Adam Sandler movies when you're not at the rink or what? I I I used to I, when I was younger. I, I mean, you know how it is in the minors and stuff, or the bus rides, or uh, there's not a there wasn't a whole lot to do in man. So we uh, I would watch movies with my roommate and, and watch TV shows, and uh, you know how it is. Did you like Uncut Gems, the gambling one? I I did that that movie was that movie the ending kind of got me out doing for a loop but yeah that was yeah. intense that whole watch i'm just like uh, i felt like i was on adderall <laughs> i know i was sweating the entire time it was it was like one of those where you're like sitting down to like kind of you know relax and enjoy your night and you're like <laughs> you're just like you're leaking air like i gotta take a shower now Toff, do you give a fuck about the leaf strout being from scarborough i i do not i think it's i think it, i mean it's it, it can't be easy playing in that market it, it's one of those things where there's so much pressure it's almost like at the start of every year, it's always the leaf year, and because of uh, they win like the first. That's because Biz says that. <laughs> you think Dubas is a it's traitor? Like they... <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know him at all. I I thought that that was like a weird press conference at, at the end of the Are year. Are you wearing a wire? I, I didn't really. I didn't. I didn't understand it. But um, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, he's got to work and he's got to pay. He's got to pay the bills now. So you know, good for him to to move on. And um, now he's he's going to work with. With Sid, <laughs> where do you Sounds spend like the summer? Calgary Canuck would say, <laughs> uh, "I'm in I'm in Hirosa Beach, so it, it's, not, nice. uh, it's not hard. It's not hard literally. Yeah, no, I, we we bought our place when when I was still playing here, and uh, it was it's nice. The, a few guys still still live out here, and some of the the Kings guys stay out here in the summer too, so I can stay with them. Does, Gre- does Greener still live there? Oh, Greener's Greener's still out here. Dude, I He's got to play with him. Uh, I got to play with him before college. Just one of—I I know you mentioned him. Probably the funniest person I've ever met. At least one of them, other than Drew Doughty. Oh yeah, uh, Dewey's just an idiot. Like Dewey just like pisses me off sometimes. He's just like so loud and obnoxious, and then you're like, at the same, at the same time, you're like, I can't believe this guy's a Hall of Famer already. He's still he's still gonna play for eight more years. Like what? it's just like ridiculous. But Greener, yeah, Greener is the Greener is the best. He he's one of those guys that can. He just goes sit in a bar and by himself, and at, you, you look around and you walk in. And there's like ten people around him talking to him because he's just yeah. telling stories and and meeting people. He's he's that's the way he is. That's the best way way to describe him. Ty, when you were a rookie, did you live with uh, other young guys or older teammates? How'd that work out early in LA? Uh, I was I was by myself, but uh, we had so Pierce. It was me, Pierce, and uh, Lynn and Bay. We were kind of getting sent up and down a little bit, and so we when we get called up, we we would move into a uh, like a residence in and you know share the room. So it, it was actually kind of nice because it was easier for us to to make the transition of going to the rink and, and skate because you know how it is. Like it's it's hard when you you go into a locker room and it, older guys and you know you're a young guy you're taking you know one of their friend spots essentially and and taking them out of the lineup and um. I think it was that made it easier for us to to kind of come in and, and break through and, and make the team. Boys, I don't well, got much else. That was awesome, I was ask, dude. It's been it, – go ahead, Bist. I was just going to maybe ask – we didn't talk about your cup parties in particular. I know that the, the, the L.A. win must have been, like, chaotic with, like, celebrities around, maybe Will Ferrell in the mix. Like, what did you do with your day with the cup? Just maybe the, the overall entire experience. It was, yeah, it was good, it, you know, being able to, to bring the cup home and, and – you know, basically for me, like show, have my parents, you know, show it off and, and, you know, bring it to the, you know, where I grew up in, in Scarborough, you know, it's, it's not, it's not every day that, you know, the Stanley Cup ends up in Scarborough. So, uh, I thought it was, it was really cool. I didn't, I didn't honestly do anything crazy with it. Obviously we, uh, we partied and, um, you know, don't remember how, half the, uh, half the party, but, um, the, but the stuff in LA was awesome. We had, we had the, uh, cup parade through, uh, downtown, which was which is cool, but you know it'd be like the Kings. We were we're we're a big deal, but we're not like the big deal like the Lakers are. Like we're not gonna you know fill the street in downtown. But we had a cup parade throughout the South Bay, which where all we live, and it was like the best day I've ever had. Where I'm on like a like a army tank with Brownie with the cup for whatever reason. Me and Brownie, I'm with the captain, and I'm like, and Brownie doesn't really drink, so I'm like, 
kind of drinking by myself and like you know we're going through the the beach is packed the people in the houses on the strand are packed and they're like throwing us beers and i'm like i'm sitting i'm sitting there with brownie and i you know like i said i was like a younger guy too so he's just laughing at me he's like you're such an idiot stuff like you know like have fun or whatever so we're just like throw people are throwing beers there's there's a photo it's i don't know if you guys have ever been uh it's in the north end north end bar and yeah the beach um, but there's a photo of, of one of the bartenders throwing me a case of beer for, to, for me to drive like with, with, you know, throughout the parade. It was, it's just, it's one of the more iconic photos for me. It was just like, it's so, it was, it's just, it was so funny. And then we end up at one of the restaurants and we're on like a patio and guys are throwing beers into the, into the fans. And I'm like, like, those are full beers. Like if that hits someone, like they're going down, like they're, they're still with the king, you know? But, um, uh, it was it was funny because that same night, I remember Kopi ripped my shirt, and I was like, I was like, fuck, I got like everybody's here, management. I was literally the only guy with no shirt on. I'm like, this isn't good. So I I I Uber home, get a new shirt, come back into the bar. I, as soon as I walk in, Kopi rips it again. And I'm like, <laughs> <"What's>, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, are you kidding me? And then finally, like, I think I like, got that time half the guy's shirts were already ripped, so I wasn't the only one. But I was just like. I was like two shirts, like you know, I'm, I'm not making the best money anymore. Like they were like nice shirts too, because I wanted to look good, you know, like a couple photos, Armani couple Exchange photos, V-necks. You know? <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, I, not 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 then. I I didn't have the body for it then. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, Those are the twenty percent body fat days. Those, that must have been a, a, a great celebration. But buddy, thank you so much for hopping on. It was it was great shooting the shit and. uh Best of luck, man. I know it's a contract. You're free. You're coming off a monster season, and I hope uh, the Calgary Canucks can turn it around. <laughs> I appreciate it. No, it, uh, this is awesome. Congrats on the Worlds, man, and uh, good luck next year. So thank you very much. Big thanks to Tyler Tafoli for jumping on with us. Great kid. He's a winner, man. I remember when he got traded to New Jersey, which the interview, like you said, G happened before then. Uh, Posh was like, is this a good trade? Like, we had to, like, totally convince him. I'm like, buddy, he's, he's a fucking 30-goal scorer, a cup. He's fucking good leader. I'm like, of course you'd want that freaking trade. But good shout with him. Like I said, it was before he went to Calgary. I, I'm sorry, New Jersey from Calgary. That's why we didn't delve into that. Uh, but, gee, you guys were chatting about something a minute ago. I didn't, I didn't catch it. What, uh, what did we just come on? Yeah, so me and my friends were having this argument earlier this week, and I kind of posed it to Merle's before you came on. But good hockey question. Not a lot of hockey talk right now. So figured I'd present it to you guys where... If an expansion team started tomorrow and you can take one player from the Eastern Conference, but you have to take them at this point in their career to start a franchise with, who would you take? So all right, I was put- like, yeah, my guy has always been Hedman. So like, I want the D-man. He can play 35 minutes, but obviously he's too old now to be that guy. And it, it was, it's tough. Like, I feel like you got to take a D or a center, right? It's, you need a guy that is going to be going to be out there. The D can be out there 30 minutes. You need the center. You watch all these Stanley Cup winning teams. They're always strong. They're built down the middle. So I was, you know, I was, I really, I really thought long and hard about Brady Kachuk. I love, I, I love his game. He's young. He's got that leader. He's going to be like his brother when he gets in the playoffs and just, he, he's just, He's great, but he's a winger. So I'm like, I'm a little hesitant to take him. And then I said, hey, Jack Hughes. But then Posh will be all over me trying to get back on the devil. So I couldn't go with him. I landed on our our guest. And I didn't do this because he's our guest. I landed on Owen Power. I'm, I'm going to take a chance on him just because he is the most like Hedman. He's big. He's a D. He's going to be durable. He can skate. He seemed like a nice kid, a good leader. So I landed on Owen Power out everybody. So I have two here. I have an RA. I'll let you, I'll let you process this a little longer. So <laughs> my first one, it's, it, it, was, it came down to Austin Matthews or Jack Hughes. And I, I'm going to go with Jack Hughes. I think both of them have... And when you're starting a team, there's so many things that play into it. But I think marketability is huge. You need someone that's going to put fans in the seat. Jack Hughes is putting fans in the seat. Austin Matthews as well is definitely putting fans in the seats. But what I saw out of Jack Hughes, I think this playoffs and this season, the way he handled the media, the way he took such a bigger leadership role on the team, I just think this kid has it all. I, I really do. Like from the way he plays his game, his, his hockey IQ to, you know, he's even a little gritty out there sometimes. So I, I think I would go with 
um, Jack Hughes, but a close second. And I know you guys might think this is crazy, but I think I would pick Igor. I think Igor Shashurkin, uh, I just, when you have a goalie, it's so, it just makes, you can build from without. Um, so I don't know. I just, uh, Igor is so fucking good. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's Jack Hughes, Igor, and then probably Austin Matthews. Yeah, I didn't think about the goalie. Yeah, that him or uh, Sorokin, either one of those New York goalies are gonna. You're gonna, and you know, kind of like Vegas when they got Flurry. Like you know, you don't have to think about that position. That's your goalie set. I like. We that, got G. seventeen of them. Yeah. <laughs> it's fu- funny. I did think goalie first all the time as as a former goalie, but uh, I was like, yeah, the last couple of years goalies haven't had to, like carry teams to the Stanley Cup. Is this gonna be a trend? Is this just uh, I don't know fluky thing? So I'll, I'm only going to go one step further. I'm going to take one from each, each position. So in that vein, I'll go uh, – De- we're building today Devin Levi, man. Uh, it's a little bit of a roll of dice. Uh, he's certainly not a proven NHL vet yet, but I love the pedigree. I like what I saw early. Uh, I would start with him. Uh, and I'm going to sound like Merle's here, but I would say on D, man, Rasmus Dahlin, man. That kid is still getting better. Uh, he, he's basically a Norris caliber candidate right now. I mean, if they got the same names. They kind of rotate each other. You can only have three finalists, but – I don't know, man. That kid is going to be, uh, by the time he's 27, 20 years old, he's definitely going to be an annual Norris, if not winner, a candidate. If you uh, say Tage Thompson here, you are doing some <laughs> hard <laughs> Buffalo pandering. No. Hey, that's my team, all right? I'm the Sabres guy. Uh, but I'm, I am going to go with, uh, with uh, a winger and uh, probably a bit of a home move here. But after what we saw Matty Kachuk do with Florida this season, uh, basically carry them to the playoffs, uh, in the playoffs until he broke his fucking sternum, then still played. Uh, that he's just got that extra something special that it offsets the fact he, he's not right in the middle in the pivot position. Matty Kachuk, man, uh, I think he proved the whole hockey world. This kid got balls of steel. Plus, he's he's an unbelievable player. So yeah, he's another the, guy who has it all, both on and off the ice. Like he's a guy that's gonna put fans in the seats. He's marketable. He's very marketable. You can make commercials about him, and he'll do the commercials. So he's active on social media. So yeah, I, I love that pick. Ra, nice, nice. Uh, so what else is shaking, boys? Anything exciting on, on next week? Last oh, we got a we got a big week this week. G. Sorry, Miles, I didn't mean to cut you there. Yeah, no, no, you guys talk about that. It's not it's some exciting news. You guys are headed up there, heading to Boston. I won't be making the trip. Uh, I don't have a passport right now. I had to send in my passport. I ran out of stamps. Ooh. I are like pages that have stamps in it. So I had to oh, I had to send it in to get a new one. So wow. I'm in the yeah. I'm waiting on that. I'm gonna get the thick one this time. So I don't. But have yeah, to worry big about week in that. Boston for us. I mean, we're. We're getting there on Monday. We're going to film some college hockey content. Tuesday, we're filming a sandbagger. I'm not going to release the name of the guest. He may have just won a Stanley Cup. Um, Wednesday, we're doing some big, big, big time interviews. Then we have the Barstool Awards at night. And then Thursday, we're out of there. So pretty jam-packed week. We're very excited, though. And uh, I can't wait to get back to Boston. And we're out of here. Me, all the way three miles back to Chucktown. Uh, I'm looking forward to it as well. My second sandbag of Merle's. I got to replace you. I might be the new bird, hey. uh, beer, beer wench on the tour yep. if you don't get back here soon. Yep. Food, and, food and beverage uh, commissioner. I like it. There we go. I always wonder what happens if, if your uh, passport gets too many stamps. So they, Will they give you a whole new one? Or like-, like years ago, you could just send it in and they would add pages to it. So we all had to do that one year when I played in Croatia. They would You would just send it in. They added the pages because in Croatia, you got stamped every time you left and every time you came in. And then every time you went to Russia... You'd have to, they would take a full page with their visas. We went to Kazakhstan, a full page for the visa, ah. but now they don't do that. Now you gotta, you gotta get a whole new passport. So I had to do all the information, send it all in, get the two mug shots, just a pain in the butt. But I had to do a time where I'm going to be here for, you know, six weeks while I'm waiting for it. And it's, it's tough. But speaking of the Sabres, some sad news this week, uh, legendary, Play-by-play announcer Rick Jenner passed away, so send some condolences to his family and friends. He was the GOAT. He was the best. Um, I, I grew up watching Sabres games, and you know, when then my buddy Conley played there, I was watching all the games. He made every game exciting, and you know, everybody knows about the legendary calls he made. Um, his longtime partner was Jim Lorenz. So if you if you're familiar with them. He was an NHL player. He played for the Bruins. He won a Stanley Cup for the Bruins. So his name was Jim Lorenz, right? That's what everybody called him. Funny story is when Rick RJ was uh, announcing in the OHL, that's where he started. Jim Lorenz was playing there, but his name was Lawrence. His name was Jim Lawrence. And Rick Jenner came down to him and said, hey, I, I, I want to say Lorenz. I, like, do you have a problem with me changing it to Lorenz instead of Lawrence? And, his, and, and Big Jim was like, nah, I don't care. So... 
next thing you know, a guy goes all the way to the NHL, becomes Jim Lorenz, ends up becoming his sidekick, the color guy for years in Buffalo. And I, I just thought that was a funny story that nobody probably hears about with RJ. You heard all the other stories. He was he was a great guy and uh, condolences to, to the family and to Sabres Nation. Very well said, Merles. I know uh, that was your neck of the woods, your big Sabres guy, so you heard him more than anyone, so it was only proper that you gave the tribute to him. It's just a, a hell of an announcer. So, All right, uh, moving right along. Gee, I don't know if you caught anything on TV movies lately. Uh, one quick uh, recommendation on Netflix. I watched the Arnold Schwarzenegger doc- documentary. It's a three-part docuseries, and you know, obviously he's in it, so which means you know he's probably a producer and co- uh, condones what's in it. And I'll tell you, man, uh, wild story. There was a guy kid grew up in Austria, like came to America. He just had this dream of being what he became, one of the biggest uh, movie stars ever. Uh, and he, you know, he has some uh, scholars in his closet. He faced it fed on, uh, straight on, man. A lot, of, a lot of guys, uh, people do these, and they, you know, they sugarcoat, uh, kind of, you know, don't address things. And you know, he he owned up to it, and he he took that on. I, he just seems like a really funny, charismatic guy, and just a hell of a, a hell of a story. The the American dream personified. So if you get a chance. Check out that Ani doc. All right. I started that uh, show Painkiller last night uh, yeah. uh, on Netflix. I watched one episode. It was pretty good. Ended up falling asleep for episode two because I was so tired because I've been on the golf course all day. I'm coming for you, Witty. But uh, yeah, I-, I loved it. I mean, I loved the first episode. I don't know if you've seen that yet. I haven't. I know. Uh, what was the one with Michael Keaton? That was just on Hulu. Same same topic, basically. I- names escape. Dope me, Sick. I- Dope Sick. Yeah. I-, I mean, I have it in my queue. It just... I don't know. Like, well, I guess when you grow up and you know so many people, you already kind of know that story when people get fucked up on it. So it's like, yeah, you know, I know the nitty gritty is a lot more info, but I'll, I'll, I'll have the appetite probably to watch it someday. But right now, it's just, I don't know. You just get frustrated and so mad at what those fucking scumbags were able to do and the havoc they wreaked on this country. But all right, uh, Merle, can't end on a, on a dollar note like that. Crayfish or crawfish? Did you have you gotten any shit for saying crayfish online? I know both are acceptable. Cray, no, I, I I just always call them crayfish. I think that's only down in the south, crawfish, okay. right? I think yeah. I think over here they everybody translated for me crayfish over here. When I was a kid, I was catching crayfish down in the swamp behind my parents' house. So I'll stick with that. I thought they were two different things. I thought crayfish was like a Swedish like type of fish or something. I I am an idiot. <laughs> We got to get you over here next August. We got to get you over here for one. Well, who knows? Uh, NHL's playing over there this season. Have to see what happens there, Merles. Yeah, I got to get you guys. <laughs> I'm working on an itinerary over here. I'm planning on you guys coming. <laughs> nice. All right, gang. Hopefully you enjoyed the interviews. We'll be back next week. Catch you later. Have a good week. 